Okay, good morning and welcome to today's City Council's fifth day of hearings on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. My name is Daniel Drum and I chair the Finance Committee. We are joined by the Subcommittee on Capital Budget, chaired by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson, and the Committee on Housing and Buildings, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Robert Cornegie. We've been joined by Councilmember Bill Perkins, Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, and I think others will be joining us shortly. Today we will hear from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, the Department of Buildings, and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Before we begin, I'd like to thank the Finance Division staff for putting today's hearing together, including the Director, LaTanya McKenney, Committee Councils, Rebecca Chasen, Noah Brick, and Stephanie Ruiz, Deputy Directors, Regina Pareda ryan and Nathan Toth, Unit Heads, Chima, Chima Obicheri and Krillian Francisco, fin Financial Analyst, Sarah Gestelbaum, and Luke Zangerle, and the Finance Division Administrative Support Unit, Nicole Anderson, Maria Pagan, Latina Brown, and Courtney Summarize, who pull everything together. Thank you all for your efforts. I'd like to remind everyone that the public will be invited to testify on the last day of the budget hearings on May 23rd, beginning at approximately 2 p.m. in this room. For members of the public who wish to testify but cannot attend the hearing, you can email your testimony to the Finance Division at Finance Terramont, fin excuse me, <coughs> finance testimony at council.nyc.gov, and the staff will make it a part of the official record. Today's executive budget hearing starts with housing preservation and development. HPD's executive budget totals $987.1 million, of which only about 26% is city funds. The agency is primarily funded through federal grants. The executive budget is approximately $155.4 million less than fiscal 2019 adopted budget because the budget does not yet recognize non-city funding that will be realized at other points during the year. In HPD's budget, we see $2.2 million in PEG savings offset by $1.9 million in new needs. Significantly, we also see the addition of $178.9 million in capital funds to reflect the acquisition of 21 cluster site buildings. The Council is encouraged that the administration is working toward its goal of eliminating cluster site housing. However, although this acquisition has been the subject of much discussion over the last few months, the Council still has many outstanding questions and frankly concerns about the process. Despite knowing that the sale was imminent, the administration chose not to include any funding for the acquisition in the preliminary budget. And now that the money is reflected, it is unclear whether it includes only the purchase price, what the cost of renovation will be, or the timeline for making the needed repairs to these apartments. In addition, I'd like to learn more about HPD's participation in large-scale multi-agency initiatives like Lead Free NYC and the Three-Quarter Housing Task Force. How does HPD collaborate with the other agencies involved in these initiatives, and are the resource levels sufficient to support the service outcomes that we expect to see? Before we, be, before we begin, I'd like to remind my colleagues that the first round of questions for the agency will be limited to three minutes per council member, and if council members have additional questions, we will have a second round of questions at two minutes per council member. I will now turn the mic over to my co-chairs, Councilmember Cornegie and Councilmember Gibson for their statements, and then we will hear from Louise Carroll, the new commissioner of HPD. Thank you. Thank you, Co-Chair Drum. Uh, good morning. I first want to acknowledge that we've been joined by uh, Minority Leader Steve Matteo and uh, Queens Representative Adrian Adams. Um, so good morning and thank you all for coming to this fiscal year 2020 executive budget hearing for the Department of Housing Preservation and Development and the Department of Buildings. I'm Councilmember Robert Cornegie and I'm the chair of the Council's Committee on Housing and Buildings. I'd like to first thank my co-chairs for this hearing, Councilmember Daniel Drum and Vanessa Gibson. Uh, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Louise Carroll to her first hearing at City Hall and her first budget hearing as HPD Commissioner. I look forward to working with you in your new capacity. We'll first hear from HPD where we'll examine all components of HPD's $987 million expense budget and $6 billion capital budget, along with details and progress related to the administration's housing plan, Housing New York. 
Over the life of the housing plan, the city has financed the creation of pre preservation of about 122,000 affordable housing units across New York City, which has exceeded projected targets and production goals. But many New Yorkers feel that these efforts are falling short of the need. An often overlooked piece of the housing plan are home ownership units created under the plan. As the chair of this committee, I'd like to shed more light on opportunities toward home ownership, which offers a path towards financial stability, but one that has become increasingly more difficult to achieve under the current housing market. I look forward to working with you, Commissioner, to increase these efforts. After HPD, we'll hear from DOB Acting Commissioner Thomas Ferriello and other senior leadership at DOB. The committees would like to get updates on the progress related to construction site safety and training compliance and enforcement. The department's implementation efforts around green buildings and energy efficiency measures related to the recently enacted Climate Mobilization Act and other initiatives reflected in the fiscal 2020 executive budget, including the expansion of DOB Now, the department's self-service online tool that allows owners, design professionals, licensees, and filing representatives to submit and file construction applications online. As a reminder, during the executive budget hearing cycle, all public testimony is to be given at one hearing at the conclusion of the cycle. This year, public testimony will be heard on Thursday, May 23rd, starting at 2 p.m. in council chambers. I believe we'll now hear from my co-chair, Vanessa Gibson. Thank you very much. Good morning to each and every one of you. Welcome to the City Council. I want to thank our Chair of Finance, Chair Danny Drum, as well as our Chair of Housing and Buildings, Chair Robert Cornegy, for convening today's very important hearing. Good morning, everyone. I am Councilmember Vanessa Gibson. I represent District 16 in the Borough of the Bronx, and I'm proud to serve as Chair of the Subcommittee on the Capital Budget. And I want to begin by once again thanking my co-chairs for convening today's hearing. This morning, we are hearing from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. And before I criticize, let me compliment and say that HPD is doing better than many other city agencies as it relates to long-term capital planning. The department's capital commitment plan realistically spreads out its planned capital spending into the outer years, which reflects commitment to executing its Housing New York affordable housing plan. And in addition, its 10-year capital strategy maintains a high level of spending beyond the capital commitment plan and at the end of Housing New York in 2026. The City Council truly appreciates the seriousness and the priority about preserving housing and expanding housing affordability into the future beyond FY 2026. Unfortunately, while it's well articulated, HPD's planned capital spending is simply insufficient to meet today's challenge. As New York grows unaffordable every single day, we must invest even more to protect and fulfill the promise of a fairer New York and an inclusive city of New York. While the Housing New York plan is an important start, it barely scratches the surface of the existing need today. In fiscal 2017, there were 736 applications per available unit that was marketed on Housing Connect's website and yet 1.7 million registered users hoping to find a housing opportunity. We call it a housing lottery, and it really is a lottery. Lady Luck should not dictate whether a New York resident can afford to continue to live in this city. So this morning and every day I've had an opportunity, I am once again calling on HPD to accelerate and expand the deployment of affordable housing to respond to our city's affordability crisis. I have deep concerns about whether HPD has the sufficient headcount to seize on every opportunity that exists to build more affordable housing or the capital capacity and the bond capacity through HDC to fund such new construction. As one example, and this is only one, I've recently learned that a planned new construction affordable housing in my own district of 500 units was cut by 250 units due to bond capacity. That is just one example and that is unacceptable. 
If we have the land and the zoning capacity to build larger multifamily affordable housing developments, capital funding and bond capacity should not be the limiting factor. I am also going to renew my call from the preliminary budget hearings that it's simply not enough to expand the top line number of affordable housing units. HPD must also deepen its affordability for residents who are the most vulnerable. HPD must seriously consider shifting its spending on affordable housing to where the need is the greatest. So we do very well in housing preservation. To date, we have met our targets on preservation and we've exceeded those targets. But we all acknowledge that we are falling short of building housing for those at the lowest end of the economic spectrum, the lowest, lowest, extremely low income. In addition, set-asides for formerly homeless families that live and go to bed in shelters every single day must be prioritized. There is a campaign called Housing Our Future by a number of advocates who are here today who have been on the steps of City Hall many, many times calling on this administration to raise the level of set-asides for formerly homeless New Yorkers to 30,000 units. I've asked OMB, I've asked HPD, and I'm going to renew my I call that this administration must consider this proposal in light of today's urgent need. We know that we are on track to build and preserve housing by 2026, but I'm more concerned about the homeless New Yorkers that live in shelters today. They need housing today, not past 2026. And so I'm asking again, the mayor has talked and really applauded his administration for the 100,000 units of housing that we have built to date, and I appreciate that, but it's simply not enough. Not when communities like mine are filtered with more shelters than we are with new construction for housing. I believe that myself and many colleagues have every right to continue to talk about this because we need more housing, we need permanent housing, and we also need housing preservation. And so I'm asking for this administration and our new commissioner to fully consider the House Our Future campaign and many other priorities that this city council has called upon in its budget response. I also want to thank, once again, the Finance Division led by Latanya McKinney and the members of the subcommittee, Minority Leader Steve Matteo, Councilmember Barry Gridenchik, Councilmember Mark Joni, and Councilmember Helen Rosenthal. And once again, congratulations, Commissioner. While I know you're not new to HPD, I welcome you as our new Commissioner for HPD. You have a tall order and lots of priorities to focus on, but this City Council looks forward to working with you and your team and making sure that as we work through this month, through this executive budget, we want to make sure that our collective priorities are reflected in the final budget. So I welcome you, I congratulate you, and I turn this hearing back over to our finance chair, Chair Danny Drum. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Gibson. I'm going to ask council to swear the panel in, and then they can begin testimony. Do you affirm that your testimony today will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? Thank you. You may proceed. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Good morning, Chair Carnegie, Chair Drum, and members of the New York City Council Committees on Housing and Buildings and on Finance. My name is Louise Carroll, and I was recently appointed Commissioner of the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development. I am joined by our Executive Deputy Commissioner, Eva Trimble, Deputy Commissioner for Enforcement and Neighborhood Services, Anne-Marie Santiago, Deputy Commissioner for Asset and Property Management, Anne-Marie Hendrickson, Deputy Commissioner for Development, Molly Park, and members of HPD's senior leadership team. This is my second week as HPD Commissioner, and I am both humbled by the responsibility and excited about the opportunity to lead an agency that is charged with tackling several of the city's most pressing problems. Having spent more than a decade at HPD, I'm familiar with the broad sweep of the agency's mission 
and have the deepest admiration and respect for the talented and dedicated people at HPD who work tirelessly every day to deliver the safe, quality, affordable housing that New Yorkers need and deserve. While at HPD, I had the honor of building inclusionary and tax incentive programs that helped produce some of the record units that we have managed to produce under Housing New York and to provide leadership on compliance and enforcement to hold landlords accountable to the promises that they made to provide affordable housing to the neediest tenants in the city of New York. I'm honored to take the torch from Eric Endelin and build on the administration's historic efforts to ensure that New York is fairer and more affordable for generations to come. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on HBD's fiscal year 2020 executive budget and how this funding will help us to achieve our agency's goals. First, I will provide a brief overview of HBD's budget before describing some of the agency's key priorities in the coming year. I'm then happy to answer any questions you may have. As you know, HPD's important work requires significant investment from the city and federal governments. HPD's fiscal year 2020 executive budget is approximately $987 million. However, this includes about $204.5 million in pass-through funding for NYCHA. So aside from this pass-through funding, HPD's true expense budget is about $782 million for FY 2020. Of this $782 million total, approximately $132 million comes from city funds and about $649 million comes from federal funds. That means 83% of HPD's expense budget is federally funded. This huge proportion of federal versus city funding in the agency's budget is important because when we seek to save tax, city tax dollars, as we are constantly trying to do, the amount we can save is limited because so many of our programs are restricted by federal requirements. City funding, especially city tax levy, is critical for flexibility and for strengthening areas not otherwise eligible for federal grant funding. As part of the executive plan, HPD received new city tax levy funding totaling approximately $5.2 million over FY19 to 23. This important funding will go towards one, our emergency repair program, an important tool to ensure the quality and safety of our housing stock when property owners fail to correct immediately hazardous conditions. Two, it will support our emergency housing services, which help provide safe accommodations for New Yorkers forced out of their homes due to unsafe or illegal conditions or in the case of natural disasters. Three, it will go to expanding the Landlord Ambassadors Program, a pilot initiative that provides outreach, education, and technical assistance to small property owners and can connect them with financing to help improve the physical and financial stability of their building. And lastly, it will continue the neighborhood preservation consultant contracts with key community organizations across all five boroughs who identify buildings that are in disrepair, by, thereby protecting tenants from displacement. <clears throat> There's a new economic reality in New York City, and we're responding accordingly. HPD has identified mandatory savings targets that will help make the agency more efficient without affecting our core priorities that make the city fairer and safer for all New Yorkers. We are thankful for the important role that city resources play in our expense budget, and my testimony will highlight several areas where this new city funding will help us further strengthen our programs and services. We continue to push forward on the broad goals of Housing New York. This includes developing and preserving affordable housing at record pace, serving more of the most vulnerable New Yorkers, protecting tenants, and enforcing their right to live in safe, quality housing, and engaging in community-focused neighborhood planning. 
In November 2017, we accelerated and expanded the plan to preserve 300,000 affordable homes by 2026. This is two years ahead of schedule and with 100,000 more homes than initially planned. To achieve that expanded goal, we released an update to the plan called Housing New York 2.0. Housing New York 2.0 offers a suite of new programs, partnerships, and strategies to help thousands more families and seniors afford their rent, buy a home, and stay in the neighborhoods they love. I'm pleased to say that last calendar year, HPD financed more than 34,000 affordable homes, setting a new high watermark for affordable housing production. With more new construction units financed, that's 10,000 more new homes financed than at any time in the agency's history. This brings the total number of homes financed under Housing New York to nearly 122,000. And while roughly 80% of all the homes created or preserved serve low-income New Yorkers, a full 40% of those homes serve families earning less than 50% of area median income or $48,000 for a family of three. Since the start of Housing New York, the city has been working to reach more homeless New Yorkers while achieving deeper affordability across the board. At a minimum, we now require at least 10% of apartments in all affordable developments be set aside for homeless New Yorkers and allocate as much as 20, 30, or even 60% in the case of our supportive housing projects. As a result, we're producing homeless housing at a faster pace than ever before, with nearly 10,000 units set aside for homeless households since the beginning of the plan in 2014. We created a new city rental assistance program to advance the mayor's commitment to create 15,000 supportive housing apartments over 15 years, and also launched a new down payment assistance fund with the Robin Hood Foundation and other partners to help not-for-profits acquire vacant private properties for supportive and affordable housing development. Since 2014, we have financed over 4,700 supportive housing units, which include units funded under New York City 1515 and prior administration housing plans. Most recently, we've partnered with the Department of Social Services in City Hall on a plan to acquire and convert cluster units to permanent affordable housing operated by local not-for-profits. The first deal transitioned nearly 500 cluster units across 21 buildings into permanent affordable housing for over 1,000 New Yorkers in need. We financed a joint ownership entity in New York City, better known as Joe, and Neighborhood Restore to acquire this portfolio and, in conjunction with several local not-for-profit organizations, stabilize and manage the buildings, coordinate light-touch social services, and prepare for rehabilitation of the buildings in the next 18 months. At the same time, this administration has made senior housing a major priority. Last year, we financed 1,831 senior homes, bringing the total number of senior homes financed in the Housing New York to nearly 7,700. This is due to programs like our Senior Affordable Rental Apartments Program, better known as SARA, and major policy changes like zoning for quality and affordability that amended the zoning resolution to make it easier and less expensive to create quality, affordable housing. housing New York under Housing New York 2.0, we introduced Seniors First, a three-pronged strategy to expand the city's existing commitment from 15,000 to 30,000 seniors served. Already, Senior housing construction in New York City has increased to unprecedented levels. Similarly, our financial commitment to senior housing has increased from 40 million in total public resources in FY14 to more than 425 million in FY18. HPD is on track to finance more than 800 units of new senior housing by FY19. There's $84 million in the budget for those senior housing projects, 
funds that will leverage debt, low-income housing tax credits, and other public subsidies. Robust pipelines and budget commitments in FY20 and 21 will ensure that more senior housing units will come online every year. HPD is also actively working to preserve the hundreds of senior housing developments that the federal government financed decades ago through the HUD 202 program. Under Housing New York, we are targeting our outreach efforts to those properties in need of protection and already have insisted 19 HUD 202, pro 202 projects for a total of 2,000 homes. Last spring, HPD launched Aging in Place, a pilot program to conduct assessments of the apartments we preserve with residents 62 years or older to finance physical upgrades that make the housing accessible to ensure that seniors can age in place. Seniors First is just one of the many initiatives in Housing 2.0 that we've been working hard to move forward. In March, we announced the community-based organizations selected through the new Partners in Preservation Program, a program to develop and coordinate anti-displacement strategies with local stakeholders and tenants in three pilot areas in the Bronx and Upper Manhattan. And this summer, we are looking to roll out our new Home Fix program to provide funding, technical assistance, and counseling to hardworking families struggling to make needed repairs and otherwise maintain their homes. This week, we are joining the American Institute of Architects, New York, to announce the finalists of our Big Ideas for Small Lots New York City Design Competition to, provo to promote innovative design and construction approaches to build housing on small, difficult to develop, city-owned vacant lots. One of my priorities will be to continue to advance the many Housing New York 2.0 programs underway, while leaving no stone unturned in identifying new approaches and new solutions to the affordable housing crisis. Another key area of focus will be building aggressively on the agency's existing efforts to protect tenants and prevent displacement, which is at the heart of our work to provide and preserve the affordability and quality of the city's housing stock. Every day, hundreds of HPD inspectors are in apartments across the city, enforcing the housing maintenance code and issuing violations when landlords are not in compliance. Our Housing Litigation Division also brings cases in housing court against owners who do not fix outstanding violations and, when necessary, seeks findings of contempt and incarceration of recalcitrant landlords. HPD also proactively combats tenant harassment by participating with the New York State Attorney General's Tenant Harassment Prevention Task Force, which investigates potential harassment and brings enforcement actions, including civil and criminal charges against landlords who harass tenants. Under this administration, we are always looking to be as proactive and comprehensive as possible in our work to protect tenants. Last year, we worked with the City Council to expand the certification of no harassment program citywide and launch a new speculation watch list to identify buildings where potentially predatory investment may put tenants at risk. We are also launching the Tenant Anti-Harassment Unit, another tool in the toolbox, which will be dedicated to pursuing potential cases of maintenance harassment and connecting tenants to legal services resources. In all of this work, we look forward to partnering closely with the new Mayor's Office to protect tenants, which will serve as a point of entry for advocates and tenants and ensure aggressive action against bad landlords. I also want to remind council members that we will be launching the third year of HPD in your district. This is where representatives from our Office of Enforcement and Neighborhood Services will spend a Wednesday in council members' districts to, in your district offices to provide one-on-one -on -one education and assistance to tenants and owners. Members also have the option of mobilizing the HPD outreach van, our new mobile office, on the same day at a location of your choice. 
I encourage you to reach out to our team if you haven't already done so to set up a day for HPD to be in your district this summer. Ultimately, all of this work is about fighting to ensure New Yorkers can afford to live and thrive in this city. But it cannot be done alone. We must do this work in the face of very real threat, threats from the federal government. Our advocacy to ensure a fully funded housing and urban development budget is critical. So far, we've been successful in fighting the president's harsh and repressive proposals. Last year, even securing for the first time in decades an increased funding for the public and affordable housing our communities desperately need. This outcome would not have been possible without the fierce and steadfast advocacy of the New York City Council, our congressional delegation, and so many partners here and across the country. But the fight is far from over. I want to thank the Council for their partnership and I look forward to continuing to find ways to partner on critical legislative priorities and needed reforms on affordable housing and supportive housing projects, on advocacy for stronger rent stabilization laws, and on a whole host of issues vital for the good of New Yorkers and for the future of our city. Thank you again for the opportunity to discuss, to discuss HBD's budget and our priorities in the coming year. This concludes my testimony, and I am happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Uh, I'd just like to start off by asking you some questions about three-quarter housing. Uh, about half of HPD's uh, in savings in fiscal 2019 and fiscal 2020 are due to one budget action, uh, which is city tax levy savings for the three-quarter housing shelter program. Um, can you describe HPD's role with respect to the three-quarter housing and what this program does? Thank you, Council Member, for this question. We at HPD are constantly trying to conserve our resources and to channel them in the right projects and at the right time in order to preserve affordable housing. Um, at the same time, we, in, in this administration and in this agency, believe that it is important to protect the neediest New Yorkers and to have available housing in cases of um, natural disaster or, or, or landlord harassment or other, any other critical time where a tenant might need such housing. At this point, I'd like to ask my budget expert, Eva Trimble, to give you a few more details about how we managed to make these savings. Good morning. The savings that are represented in the executive plan are due to us leveraging additional federal funding, specifically CDBG funding for the program. So we were able to give back to OMB and the city some of the tax levy funding that they provided originally to support the program. Um, for more information on, on our role in the task force, I actually defer to Deputy Commissioner Amory Santiago to tell you about the work we've been doing with the task force. Good morning. So uh, from the enforcement side, we do have uh, inspectors who conduct inspections with the other members of the task force as requested. Um, we issue violations of the Housing Maintenance Code and we look for occupancy issues. Um, so that is the enforcement side. On the, um, the housing side, uh, if vacate orders are issued by any agency, then our agency does provide the emergency housing. So there's been a continuous savings uh, that occurs on this, bu on this budget line. Can you explain why that is? Yes, when the program originally started, we weren't sure what the, client, what the characteristics of the clientele were going to be. CDBG has uh, specific requirements in order for us to claim the shelter costs and the relocation uh, services that we provide as, as eligible for CDBG reimbursement. So we worked with OMB to make sure there was enough tax levy in the budget to support the efforts of the task force and have been working with OMB as well to claim CDBG funding for all of the clients that we're serving. So it's been a real collaborative effort and we're happy to turn the money back over to the city now that we don't need it. So you're um, confident the program has been successful and um, 
is any of the need winding down? Is there less need for three-quarter um, housing? There have been many successful placements of the clients into permanent housing. From the initial round of uh, voluntary vacates that we did, only 43 households remain in our, in our services. There are additional inspections being scheduled with the task force, but we believe we'll be able to sufficiently fund those costs going forward. Okay. Um, let me talk a little bit about the hiring freeze savings. HPD's fiscal 2020 executive budget freezes 20 positions, resulting in $564,000 in savings in fiscal 2020, growing to a million dollars in fiscal 2021 and in the out years. As of March 2019, HPD has a vacancy rate of approximately 8%, far higher than the citywide average of approximately 2%. So what titles and positions are included in the freeze and will service levels be impacted? So first of all, I'd like to say that no service levels will be impacted. Um, we are committed to the work that we do and we are very efficient in the way that we, we do this work. Mm -hmm. The partial hiring freeze has resulted in a surplus budget, but these um, the, the hiring freeze is not connected to a particular uh, job or particular title. And so we have uh, made the savings through natural attrition and from uh, reducing new hires. If you, for further details, uh, our executive for a budget, Eva Trimble, can answer some more questions. Uh, following on what the commissioner just said, uh, we, we are working to prioritize positions through this hiring, partial hiring freeze. Uh, things have definitely slowed down and that's created some some cash surplus for the agency. However, we are working with OMB to get critical hires approved and we are managing our attrition. So at any point, we, we do have some natural flow uh, that, that allows us to continue hiring those positions that we see as a priority. Okay, let me talk a little bit now about uh, lead-free New York City. It's a big issue for me. I used to be a New York City public school teacher and I know the effects firsthand of lead poisoning on children. Um, the preliminary plan added funding for two positions and additional expenses uh, to support work related to the Lead Free New York City Citywide Initiative, which seeks to eliminate childhood lead exposure citywide by expanding mandates under Local Law 1 of 2004. So do these new positions reflect the total staff uh, dedicated to this work, um, or how many staff are there? So let me start by saying that um, our commitment to safe affordable housing in the city, especially for children and families, um, is, is strong and it's very important to us. For details on the staffing and how we are um, doing this work, I'd like to ask Anne-Marie Santiago to respond. So. Um, good morning again. Good morning. Uh, so we have been funded with $4.5 million to support Lead Free NYC, and that includes 37 heads, actually. Um, some of the money, I believe, is reallocated from other CDBG uses to this purpose. Uh, the $4.5 million will go to support not only staff, inspector staff, uh, and clerical staff, admin staff, but also technology improvements and actual money for repairs. Um, so we believe that this, uh, this amount is crucial to us meeting the goals of Lead Free NYC, which as you know, uh, if you're following it, are very extensive. Um, HPD will be increasing inspections, be increasing audits, uh, and we believe that this funding is sufficient at this time. How many violations uh, were issued and corrected by HPD in 2018? Specifically for lead? Yeah. So. HPD issued 11,027 violations in FY18 and spent 1.1 million to correct violations and ensure safety of tenants. Okay. How many lead paint violations issued since Local Law 1 of 2004 became effective um, are currently open? And what is HPD doing to correct those um, violating conditions? So we're working to figure out the categories of these violations and what's open to reflect the full picture. Um, we can share this information with the council shortly, but we don't have this information today. So we'd okay. like to get back to you. We'll follow up with you on that in, uh, in a letter. Absolutely. 
um, of the violations that was certified as having been corrected by the building owner in 2018, how many were reinspected by HPD, and how many owner certifications were audited by HPD or a third party? Um, HPD is required under Local Law 1 to attempt to reinspect all owner certifications. So if we go out to reinspect it and we're not able to get access, the violation remains open. Is, so the answer is 100%. Is what? The violation remains open if we're unable to observe that the condition has been corrected. And what did you say was 100%? We are required to reinspect all certified violations. So eventually you get to all of them? Correct. And we make several attempts to get into an apartment to confirm, um, but the violation may, may remain open if the tenant doesn't give us access. Okay, thank you very much. All right, that's all for me, and I'm going to turn it over now to Chair Cornegie for questioning. Thank you, Chair Drum. Um, Commissioner, I am going to have my first round of questions be central to my opening statement, which was uh, in relationship to home ownership programs. Um, HPD's executive commitment plan includes $6 billion in fiscal 2019 through 2023 to support the department's planned spending on programmatic housing initiatives. Of these available capital resources, how much is dedicated for home ownership programs? So we have currently, we've dedicated $39.4 million between FY19 and FY23 in the capital budget for homeownership programs. Does that represent a, a substantial growth from past years? Absolutely. Um, you know, to date, we have produced approximately 23,000, um, we financed approximately 23,000 new homeownership units, and that is... Um, more than has ever been done in, the pre in any previous administration. So of the housing starts to date under the Housing New York Plan, how many are for home ownership? So um, I don't actually have that. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question? So of the housing starts to date under the Housing New York Plan, how many are for home ownership? So as I, I said, um, th we do have approximately 23,000 new homeownership units financed under Housing New York. How many programs provide down payment assistance and how, many f and how much funding is dedicated to providing down payment assistance? Thank you, Council Member. So we are very proud of our efforts to provide home ownership opportunities to our to low-income tenants. Our Home First program provides up to forty thousand dollars to a down payment or closing cost for first-time home buyers who earn up to about eighty thousand dollars, um, eighty percent AMI, which is about seventy-eight thousand dollars for a family of three. So I, um, I have questions about um, what type of outreach is done and how are people made aware that these programs exist? Because as I come and go as the Housing and Buildings Chair, I often uh, will ask if people are aware, and more often than not, people are not aware of the robust opportunities that are available for Pathways to Home Ownership. So when we, when we create affordable housing units through our term sheets and we go through our marketing process, many are, are marketing agents and NHBD encourage homeowners for, to take a class, to take a homeowners class, and also to apply to our down payment assistance fund. And so whenever we're marketing units and putting home ownership units out there, we're also marketing our services in order to um, help tenants or future homeowners be successful in acquiring uh, these homeownership op opportunities. In addition, our HPD van, which goes out to many different communities, has information in many different languages about our homeownership opportunities and the opportunity to get a down to get down payment assistance through Home First. This van has um, translations in about 17 different languages in order, and in order to reach homeowners throughout the city. And in addition, when we market our units, they're marketed in many different newspapers in many different languages. Um, so that, that's what I was gonna ask is what is your traditional, is, is it a traditional marketing plan through um, commercials, through advertisements in press? And if so, 
Um, are, are, is ethnic media a part of your marketing plan? Absolutely. Um, when we market our units, we make sure that we market them in various newspapers that produce content in different languages so that we're reaching the maximum um, number of, of people and a variety of people of ethnic and uh, backgrounds that we can. Um, we also have translators who go out in our van and, and people who speak different languages in our van so that when people come to the HPD van, they're able to receive not only written content in those 17 different languages, but they're also con able to speak to someone, um, to speak to a translator or have content translated to them. Um, in addition, I, I, we have um, Anne-Marie Hendrickson, who heads the division that has our marketing, and I'd like her to just say a little bit more about some of our processes. Yep. So good morning, and thank, thank you very much. Um, what I wanted to do is add on to the commissioner and talk about our housing ambassadors, because that's a program that we launched a few years ago where we only were using about 17 community-based organizations. We use 46 organizations now throughout the city, and these housing ambassadors are used to help um, educate constituents on how to apply for housing. Um, they also talk about all the various um, down payment assistance programs and other kind of avenues we have to help people have more streamlined access to home ownership. So while I appreciate um, and respect all of those, I would just like to add that council members would certainly like to be marketing ambassadors as well for programs, especially those that lead to pathways of home ownership to home ownership. So I'm going to offer my office as your first housing ambassador from the council. And I think that I, uh, my colleagues would all chime in that they'd like to be a part of a program <laughs> that allows them to be ambassadors for housing opportunities that are directly related to uh, home ownership. Uh, and my final question in this round is, uh, in 2018, how many down payment assistance loans were issued to homeowners citywide? And what's the average loan amount that's awarded? So in FY18, we assisted 92 first-time home buyers with down payment assistance, and the average loan that was given to them is $18,448. Thank you. Um, I believe I'd just like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Mark Joni, uh, Councilmember Keith Powers, uh, Councilmember Richie Torres, and Councilmember Carlina Rivera. Oh, and Barry Gredenshaw. <laughs> 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 Sorry, Barry. Okay, Council, uh, Chair Gibson. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Chair Drum and Chair Cornegy. And once again, good morning, Commissioner, to you and your team. And uh, we look forward to working with you uh, during this budget process, which will be your first as Commissioner. Um, so in my opening, I talked about the agency's 10-year capital strategy, which unlike many other city agencies, actually has a real 10-year plan um, beyond housing and why uh, there is millions of dollars that are dedicated post housing and why past 2026. Um, but I wanted to understand that Although the Housing New York plan aims to build or preserve about 300,000 units of affordable housing by 2026, the 10-year capital strategy does reflect the continuation of funding through 2029. Um, we noticed that between the prelim and exec, in HPD's 10-year capital strategy, there was a decrease of $200 million from prelim to exec. Um, can you explain where that $200 million went and what was that designated for? Thank you, council member, for this question. So um, as we previously mentioned, um, we funded the clusters sites. The, there were 17 buildings across 21 sites that the city helped fund in order to provide 1,000 units of affordable housing to the neediest New Yorkers. And that $200 million represents a, a front loading to FY19 of the money to provide that housing. Is that the actual cost of the acquisition? No, council member, and I'm glad that you asked this. The actual acquisition price is $173.5 million. But there was some money that we added to the project for reserves, 
for security and for other needed repairs and soft costs in order to um, provide the best housing quality that we could at acquisition. Okay, so if that 200 million was taken out, then where are the funds that you talked about to use as we transition, purchase these buildings, acquire them, and turn them over to local not-for-profits? Because there are a number of things that need to be done during the interim that you talked about in your opening. So where are those funds reflected in the executive budget? Absolutely. So the site's already acquired. The reserves are funded for both the security and light construction work. Okay. And so, and that property has already been turned over to not-for-profits. We intend to do a full scope of work on those sites and fund future repairs in the next 12 to 18 months. Okay, so you said the uh, acquisition price was $173.5 million, but in the executive capital budget, there's a cluster sites program budget line that actually says $178.9 million in fiscal 2019. So is that the difference you're talking about with acquisition and renovation costs? Yes, council member. Okay. Good to know. I'm glad we clarify that. Okay. Um, now, in addition, the administration indicated that the new not-for-profit owners of these properties, once they take over, will conduct a very detailed assessment of physical needs, assessment of the infrastructure, both interior and exterior, to determine the level of work needed. Um, this is something I've been very, very critical of during the acquisition process itself, because I realize that these buildings, and I might add, the majority of which are in Bronx County, in my borough, um, are in need of significant capital work, not just for the cluster families, but for the traditional families that have remained in these buildings to date. So my question is, what is the timeline on the physical needs assessment? Is HPD going to do any of that interim work? What is the timeline for the not-for-profit? And then my bigger question is, who is going to pay for all of the work that is needed to renovate these cluster now permanent buildings? Thank you, council member, for these questions. Um, so typically when, when we acquire a site in this way, um, what, H, what HPD has done is help the not-for-profits by funding re initial reserves so that they can do immediate repairs. What happens next is that a capital needs assessment will be done for the building. That capital needs assessment will be provided to HPD for review. And between HPD and the not-for-profits, we will arrive at what the right level of rehab work will be for the, for the safe quality housing that we like to provide. Um, that will be in the course of um, our closing pipeline, so we expect to see this project close in the next 12 to 18 months. And in, in that next 12 18 to 18 months, that scope of work will be taking place, that review between HPD and the not-for-profit will be taking place. And we, between the not-for-profit and HPD, we will arrive at the right financing for the project in order to make sure that these needy repairs reach tenants. Okay, so that means that because of the time frame you just outlined, uh, the council should not expect to see any final determination of uh, scope of work costs reflected in this final budget. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, so whatever work is being done in the interim, if there are emergency repairs that need to be done to address heat, hot water, and other basic necessities, that will be done with existing HPD funds? Yes, that will be done with the additional funds that are in addition to the acquisition price. Okay, and do you have a time frame on when the not-for-profits will be identified? The not-for-profits have been identified. They currently own the properties. Um, basically, we partnered with Joe NYC and Neighborhood Restore to purchase these properties. Within the Joe, there's an umbrella of other not-for-profits that will help and assist in the management and um, the rehab of those buildings. Uh, the final not-for-profits that will own these buildings have not been identified. Okay, so I'm asking I'm if- I'm sorry, uh, they, I, okay. excuse me, I'm sorry. I'm being told that they, 
they have been identified. <laughs> okay, so it's important if the council could receive that information, particularly the council finance division of the not-for-profits that have been identified, and then I would certainly suggest a meeting or a conversation with council finance and the council members that represent these cluster buildings um, so that we can look at the smoothest transition uh, with minimal disruption as possible. Thank you, council member, we'll do that. Okay, um, and then I believe we asked the former acting uh, HPD commissioner as well as Steve Banks from HRA, um, if the administration is looking future-wise, the remaining cluster units we have, um, I thought it was anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of the portfolio remains in cluster housing through 2021, if we are looking at additional acquisitions uh, with these particular properties as well. Is that a conversation we're having? I appreciate that question, council member. It is absolutely a conversation we're having. We're looking to pull more of these cluster sites out of private hands and ending the cluster program that has gone on for 17 years. We plan on trying to bring these buildings into responsible ownership of not-for-profits that we trust and to rehab these buildings to provide the quality affordable housing that um, we uh, our mission is to provide. And so we are in discussions with um, the DSS and we're looking to them to give us the next phase of sites. Okay, great. Um, I wanted to ask a question about prioritizing permanent housing under Housing NY. Um, as you heard in my opening, and I'm sure your staff and team knows very well that this is a, a very important issue to me personally, but also to this council. Um, we called in our budget response, we called on the administration to fully prioritize permanent housing solutions well over homeless shelter spending. And of the 300,000 affordable housing units that the administration is aiming to create or preserve under Housing New York by 2026, 5%, 15,000 units will be made available to homeless households. Over the life of the city's housing plan, the city has financed the preservation and the creation of over 5,600 non-supportive homeless units. So my question is, can you provide the estimated cost of what it would be to increase the number of homeless set-aside units from 15,000 to 30,000 under Housing New York? What is this administration going to do, as you noted, to accelerate and prioritize housing for formerly homeless families to transition into permanent housing? Thank you, council member, for this question. Um, I really appreciate this question because this administration shares your values in preserving housing and producing housing for the most needy New Yorkers. We have um, accelerated our plan. We've provided over 10,000 units so far of housing for homeless New Yorkers. Going forward, we are making sure that most of our projects have at least 10% set aside of housing for homeless New Yorkers. And in other cases, we're providing 20, 30, and as high as 60% of housing for homeless New Yorkers. Um, our housing set aside for homeless New Yorkers is a portion of all of the housing we produce in a project. So we're not able to say on a case-by-case -case basis exactly how much it would cost to provide housing for the homeless. It is part of, an, of a, a full project to provide a range of housing for very, very low income New Yorkers. And we are um, conscious and, and um, careful not to be making trade-offs between one low income family versus another. So we're really trying in all of our efforts, in all of the different programs that we have under Housing New York, and in all of the term sheets that we produce to create a tide that rises all boats, that we're providing housing for homeless New Yorkers and we're also pri providing housing for um, low-income families. So for example, a home health aide who's making $15,000 um, $15 an hour and has a full-time job is sometimes unable to um, 
qualify for the lowest income housing that we produce. That that um, home health aid has a, is a single mother or a single father or a, a person with a child, we want to be able to provide home housing for them as well. So while we are doubling down on our efforts and we're going forward making sure that we have at least 10% homeless set aside in all of our, our, um, our, our productions, we are trying to balance housing throughout the city for a variety, variety of needy New Yorkers. Right, I appreciate the uh, response and I appreciate the city's commitment, Commissioner, but with all due respect, it's not enough. It is not enough. We are not asking here at the council to choose one side versus the other. We know that many, all, most New Yorkers are in need. But what we're simply asking for is for this administration and HPD, the agency that is tasked with the responsibility to really create a fairer and more inclusive city of New York to prioritize. We have been doing great in many other areas and we have the numbers to reflect that. But what we all must acknowledge where we are failing and falling short is on housing for homeless New Yorkers. Most of the projects and the 10% you alluded to, while that's a minimum, there are some neighborhoods that don't even absorb the minimum 10%. There are some neighborhoods like mine where we get more than 10%, but when we have conversations with developers and we ask for the higher set-asides at 15 and 20%, their response is that they get pushed back from HPD. And so we're trying to understand where the miscommunication lies and where the real priority is. If we are committed to New Yorkers and we are committed to understanding that those who are the most vulnerable. All the categories I described, I would argue, are vulnerable, but we're talking about those that are the most. The majority of the families living in shelters are employed. They have a job. The faces of homelessness we know come from our communities and they are employed, but they're simply not making enough. And so what we're trying to get to a point is asking this agency to prioritize formally homeless New Yorkers and getting them into the housing that they need. I'm sure you agree and understand that most of the housing projects that we construct, 30,000 to 50,000 applications per construction project. And these are New Yorkers that are trying to move into new construction. And so when I'm asking the agency, what is the estimate of what it will cost? I'm sure that HPD has a number. We know how much it costs to finance projects. Is there any estimate that you can provide to us on what it will cost to get from 15,000 to 30,000 units of housing for formerly homeless families? I'm asking for a number or some resemblance of an estimate of what it will cost. Thank you, council member. We agree that we should do more and that we will try to do more. We and, can do more. And that we will work with you in the future to try to find ways to do more. Today, we don't have that number for you because that is just not the way we organize our term sheets and that's just not the way we produce our housing. It's really our term sheets have a subsidy amount per dwelling unit and we try to balance the ranges of incomes in a project so that higher income units cross subsidize the lower income units. But we're happy to talk and we're happy to talk further. This is just my second week on the job, so no, I, I look forward to sitting with you and, and, and your staff and with the very talented team that we have at HPD to see how we can tackle this issue. Okay, well I have one solution. Um, HPD's new construction term sheets, some of them have not been updated for years. Here's a start. Some of the term sheets that we have that incentivize increasing the rate of homeless unit production, can we look at revising some of those term sheets where we can provide financial tax credit incentives so that we can stimulate more housing for homeless New Yorkers? That's an idea. Thank you, Council Member. We are in the process 
of updating our term sheets. Most of our term sheets were updated in 2017, mm -hmm. but we are again no. looking at these term sheets and we are again revising them and we look forward to talking with you to see how we can do more. Okay, um, I just have one question again before I turn it over to my colleagues and we get to another round. Um, the Landlord Ambassador Program that you talked about, um, the fiscal, 2020 executive budget adds about $750,000 in fiscal 2020 as well as fiscal 2021 for uh, the administering of the program. Can you tell me what the current budget is for the Landlord Ambassador Program and were the additional funds that were added in these two years enough to sustain the program? And I ask that because I'm very familiar with the Landlord Ambassador Program. I give credit that it's successful, it's working. Um, but previously, I was under the impression that this program cost closer to $2 million to administer, and it was a partnership with Enterprise. Um, organizations in my district in the Bronx, like Northwest and others, are administering the program, but I was under the impression that it was closer to $2 million. So can you tell me where the 750 came from, and is that sufficient to operate this program? So. Currently, there's no um, city money uh, funding this program. Correct. correct. It was all private, right. It is a pilot, and it was all um, funded with um, enterprise through mm -hmm. settlement money. Right. What we're asking for is money to continue the program and in an effort to try to make it permanent. The program is very expensive to run because it takes a lot of outreach and a lot of um, assistance to the people, to the, the um, tenants and neighborhoods and the owners of smaller residential buildings to make sure that they understand what the resources are for them and um, to stabilize their homes. So as you, as, as you alluded, the program has been very successful. Out of 77 participants in the pilot, 39 owners have applied to HBD for financing in exchange for affordable housing. And of the participating buildings, we've seen significant reductions in vacancies. So there's been a 72% reduction in vacancies and a 42% reduction in violations. Um, what we're asking for is funding to continue the program and possibly to expand the program. So is $750,000 sufficient? Council member, I will ask my, my Deputy Commissioner for Development to take that question. Hi, thank you. Molly Park, Deputy Commissioner for Development. Um, we have some additional money coming in through Enterprise for the program. We are excited to have some city funds coming in through the administration. I think we have been talking to the city council and we would really like to work with you further on partnering. Um, we are in the place right now where we are pulling together lots of different funding sources to uh, make permanent and grow something that we think has a lot of potential and we'd like to work with you on that. Okay, so my figure of two million is more accurate, right? That's been the budget so. for the, that was the two year budget for the full program. As I say, we do have some other funding sources besides the 750 that we've identified already and have some more that we're working on. Okay, okay, thank you. I'll turn it back over to Chair Drum. Actually, we're gonna go to Chair Cornegie. Thank you, Chair Gibson and, Ken, and Chair Drum. Um, I wanna talk to you about some uh, revenue generating proposals that were made from this body to the administration, one in particular. Um, as you know, property owners of residential buildings are required by law to res register annually with HPD if the property is a multiple dwelling, which is three or more residential units, or a private dwelling, which is one or two residential units. The fee for registration is currently is $13 per building, which is billed directly to the Department of Finance. The Council's fiscal 2020 preliminary budget response called on the administration to convert this flat fee to a $2 per unit fee. IBO estimates that this would increase revenue collections by 2.4 million annually. This action is not reflected in the fiscal 2020 executive budget. Can HBD state their position on this revenue proposal? Thank you very much, Commissioner, for this question. So HPD is... I don't know if that oh, sorry. was the motion <laughs> council or, member, I don't know if that sorry. was the motion or promotion. <laughs> Thank you, council member, for this question. I, know. I think I just demoted you. <laughs> um, so, HPD is obligated to charge fees based on the actual cost of service that we provide. 
the purpose of um, this registration is for us to identify owners in case of emergency. So if there's an emergency or there's an emergency repair, HPD needs to know exactly, or a complaint, HPD needs to know exactly who to, who, who to contact. And that is the sole purpose of this application. So the requirements of the application are the same, whether you have a 100 unit building or you have a four unit building. And therefore we are unable to unequally um, allocate costs in that way. Thank you. Uh, would HPD consider including unit level information as part of the registration filing process? Um, I would like to ask my uh, Deputy Commissioner, Anne Santiago, to answer this question. Thank you. Uh, again, Council Member, as, as the Commissioner stated, the purpose of the registration is to be able to reach the, the property owner, and that's really what we use it for to service our, to issue notices of violation to provide service and to provide contact information. And there's really no necessity for unit level information uh, as part of that application. We receive information about the owner, uh, any site management at the property, and the managing agent. And that's really the key information that we require. Yeah, but isn't, isn't any issues with the unit um, provided by the occupant of the unit? Yes, but the occupant can change at any time, and so having permanent information of that type is not helpful to us. Anytime someone files a complaint with us, we reach out to the managing agent and or the owner. The, the occupant will provide us their contact information at the time they file a complaint. So my, I saw my colleague, uh, Rafael Espinal, who was here earlier, and I want to ask some questions on his behalf on the basement apartment program and the spending. Uh, city funds of 2.2 million were added to fiscal 2019 and fiscal 2020 to support a basement apartment pilot program in East New York to assist building owners with bringing existing underground apartment units up to code, obviously for the purpose of safety and for bringing these units uh, as affordability onto the market. Um, HPD's fiscal 2020 executive budget reflects savings in fiscal 2019 and fiscal 2020 under this program. What accounts for these spending changes? Thank you, Council Member. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say I'm very excited about this program, and I'd like to thank Council Members Lander, Barron, and Espinal for their partnership in helping us get um, to this, this pilot. Uh, the program is in its pilot stages, and um, basically what you're seeing is a right-sizing of the budget to account for monies that would be needed immediately as opposed to monies that we would be needed long term for the program. So basically if we, we budgeted monies for, for out years and we're basically showing a reduction in that budget for out years to what is immediately needed. How do you, expe how do you expect to use those savings though? So, uh, Basically, if you're budgeting for a three-year program and you're asking for, let's say, um, $300,000 for three years, what we're actually doing now is recognizing that we don't need all of that money today. We only need what it, the money that um, is required for the program in this budget, and when we need further funds, we'll ask for it in the next budget. Okay. Um, I should have asked this question probably first, but can you provide an update on the status of that program? Because we're all excited about the program. <laughs> so we are still in the implemental, implementing stage. Um, the program has not been fully launched. We are reaching out to um, qualified building owners, and so we're, we're still at the very beginning of the pilot. So, so how, at currently, how many building owners are currently qualified to receive subsidies through the program? Do we know? We expect to serve about 40 building owners through this pilot currently. So um, in, initially in the program, while I was excited about it and remain excited about it as well, I was a little bit concerned about people's willingness to participate in the program. What form of outreach are we using to get and bring members on board? And do we think it's sufficient? Is there something else we could be doing? Because I just feel like people who, are, who have basement apartments yes. um, may uh, not be willing to be a part of the city's program for obvious reasons. 
Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, council member for this question. I'd like to I ask. I don't know what my um, future holds. The Deputy Commissioner, I know. Two and a half years left here, I don't know. It, it seems that we really want you on our team. <laughs> um, uh, I'd like to ask Deputy Commissioner Anne Marie Santiago to answer this question. I'm going to jump in because uh, because the basements uh, initiative is going to be run out of development. Um, so we have partnered with local organizations, uh, in particular with with Cypress Hills LDC, to do to organize and and run the program. We're doing a lot of outreach through our uh, through the nonprofit, through the and through HPDs traditional outreach initiatives, um, such as the commissioner mentioned with the van. I think we would very much welcome opportunities to partner with you to look for additional outreach uh, moments. I will say that we are actually trying very hard to have entities other than HPD be the primary face of the outreach um, for exactly the reasons that you described, that um, for the city to come in and take a look at your basement apartment is potentially problematic. Having the nonprofit intermediary do it is is a less concerning for homeowners. So that's why we have, are working very closely with nonprofit partners. Um, so just my last question on this is, uh, has, have any loans been issued to begin the basement apartment right away? Not, not yet, we're still in the implementation phase. So I, I guess my concern is that what if um, we get to a place where um, we haven't made the movement in the time period that are prescribed for the program, what do we, what do we then do? Well, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we have structured things in such a way that we will be able to meet the timeframes of the program, but I think we are gonna keep a close eye on that and try and, before I can suggest a response, I'd, I'd need to know what the concerns were, right? Is it, if we're gonna have a different answer to that question, whether it's households aren't willing to come in the door for whatever reason versus say they're in the door and they're working with us and there is an operational hiccup in there. So, but I am cautiously optimistic we'll be fine. Will, will there be an impact on the budget if this goes longer than anticipated? Um, we've been working very closely with OMB on this, although they've done some technical realignments as you noted initially. I'm confident that we'll, we'll bring the budget in for when the dollars are actually needed. So again, that completes my questions for this round. Um, I'll, I'll uh, go back to Co-Chair Danny Drum. Okay, and we're gonna go back to um, Councilmember Gibson followed by Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask a, a quick question about the low income housing tax credit program because the capital budget allocates a portion of the state of New York's federal low income housing tax credit. And every year that amount, as I understand, is negotiated with the state of New York. Um, typically HPD allocates anywhere from 12 to $14 million in tax credits per year to 20 or more projects that ultimately would create about 1,000 units of low income housing. Um, in calendar year 2019, do you know how much will be reserved for HPD in this program? I think the acronym is LICH, I think. Um, and for how many affordable housing units would that cover? Thank you, Council Member, for that question. So under the LITEC allocation. Oh, LITEC, for LICH. <laughs> I can't with these acronyms. <laughs> so basically there are um, two types of, of um, tax credits. There are for the 4%, which um, is associated with our bond financing and um, the 9% um, low income housing tax credits for which we allocated 18120357 in credits um, to about 13 developments with a total of 1,001 units. And um, the way we allocate those credits are, are different. So, you know, the 4% the tax credits is a non competitive uh, tax credit program, and the 9% um, tax credits is a competitive program. Okay, so year to date, the amount that's negotiated with the state, does that typically increase if there's a greater need that comes from New York City, or has it hovered around that 12 to $14 million year after year? The low income housing tax credits is a federal program, and basically the allocation is by population. By population in New York City, not by so it is um, AMI. so the state 
gets an allocation and right. they and have they to allocate to. throughout the state and New York City gets its allocation from the state of the 9% based on population. Okay, so does the federal government track the population growth or is it the state? So um, I don't, I don't have the answer to that. I'm going to ask uh, my deputy commissioner for development to answer okay. that question. Sure. The the federal government does the population estimates that that allocates the individual tax credits to the state. Uh, in the Tax Reform Act, one of the very small silver linings in the Tax Reform Act was actually an increase in nine percent tax credits, which is why. We got about $18 million last year as opposed to the $14 million that has been the historical number. Um, the, the state allocation, sub-allocation from the state down to New York City has remained relatively constant with the exception of that bump um, from the Tax Reform Act. Okay. It's gone up slightly, but, but, um, but only fairly slightly. Okay, and who determines the criteria by which projects actually receive the LIHTC tax credits? Is it HPD? And if so, what does that criteria look like? Uh, HPD, yes, HPD does um, determine the criteria. So every year we put out a qualified allocation plan, better known as the QAP, and um, every year we update it and uh, developers are able to look at what that criteria is and compete for the, cr the credits based on scoring of that criteria. And so the criteria includes readiness of the project, the um, income level of tenants that are being served, whether the project is in um, an area of priority for the city, for example, maybe a rezoned area or um, other area of, of interest for the city, whether the property is distressed, when we use the, the credits on preservation projects, how distressed financial or otherwise, um, the use of not-for-profit partners, and also how um, cost-effective the project is. These are some of the criteria that's in the QAP. Okay, I uh, wanted to ask about partners in preservation. You talked about that in your opening. Uh, last July, we launched this as a pilot, uh, really focusing on a lot of anti-displacement initiatives. And I'm sure you recognize the priority that the city council has on anti-displacement. Uh, just last week, we passed a package of 17 bills related to anti-displacement across the city. Um, the initiative, uh, has been piloted in most recently the rezoned neighborhoods, uh, East Harlem and Jerome in the Bronx. Um, and I wanted to understand how many groups to date have been funded to do this work. Um, and within HPD, is there a dedicated staff to the Partners in Preservation Program? Thank you, council member, for this question. We are very excited about Partners in Preservation. It is one of our many anti-displacement tools, like the Landlord Ambassadors Program, like the Clusters Program, and um, basement apartment conversion, including our efforts on rent stabilization reform to basically protect tenants from being displaced from their communities. Um, I'd like to ask my Deputy Commissioner for Planning, Leila Borzog, to take this question. Okay. Hello. Um, uh, my name is Leila Borzog, Deputy Commissioner for Neighborhood Strategies. So we have um, a relatively new unit within our neighborhood um, development and stabilization team um, focused on partners in preservation. There's three project managers dedicated um, to the program, one for each of the pilot areas. Um, their portfolio is a little bit broader than partners in preservation, but I, I'd say their portfolio is about at least 80% partners in preservation. Uh, any chance to grow that as partners in preservation uh, does this work? And I'm sure we'll be expanding beyond East Harlem and Jerome and Inwood. Um, our goal is to certainly evaluate the program after the pilot period. Um, the period of performance will go until about November 2020. Um, and we, you know, depending on what we find through the program and whether it's an effective tool for anti-harassment, um, anti-displacement, 
work, um, we would certainly look to expand that. I'd, I'd also just like to add that in addition to the three staff, you know, those are three project managers coordinating. There's a lot of other staff at HPD that will be helping with this initiative, folks in our enforcement and neighborhood services that we'll, we'll be partnering with, folks in our um, preservation finance team that we'll be partnering with as buildings come in and as we develop action plans for the, for the buildings that are identified, we'll be kind of connecting them to other HPD tools. So it's, it's broader than, than just the three. Okay, and I was very uh, happy to learn that uh, earlier this year in March, uh, there were organizations that were awarded uh, several thousand dollars to do this work. And I'm grateful that the administration acknowledges that in the anti-displacement work, it also involves and includes tenant organizing. Um, there are a number of buildings in many of our districts where tenants are not coming forth with issues, and it's simply because of either their status, they're fearful, they've been harassed, all sorts of tactics that many landlords unfortunately use. And so to me, this work um, really revolves around tenant organizing and strategizing with tenants associations and putting them together to make sure that tenants understand their rights and what services that they are afforded. So I'm grateful that that was announced in March and now uh, the work will begin very shortly. Thank you. Okay, um, I had a question about the TIL program, the Tenant Interim Lease Program. Chair Robert Cornegy and I, during the prelim, um, heard extensive, extensive testimony from tenants, predominantly in the South Bronx and Northern Manhattan, who expressed their opposition to a lot of the building rehab work that was being completed under the ANCP program, which you're very familiar with, the Affordable Cooperative Program and they were outright upset, pissed off, I mean, everything you can think of. And what I wanted to understand is how many buildings are left in the TIL program, and if the tenants don't agree to carry an underlying 30-year mortgage, what other renovation options are available to them? So is it only ANCP? What other options do we have in our toolbox that we can afford to residents that still live uh, in TIL programs, in TIL program buildings? So I'm incredibly proud of the work that this team has done on both um, ANCP and the TIL program in general. Um, there are 115 buildings still left in that program, and the team has worked incredibly hard to make sure that you know, tenants that are living in substandard buildings have these buildings renovated and are quickly moved to homeownership opportunities where possible. I would like to ask my Deputy Commissioner Anne-Marie Hendrickson to, uh, to answer further questions on this program. So good morning and, and thank you. Um, I handle the tenant interim lease compliance side of the program. Actually, my colleague Molly um, Park handles the affordable neighborhood co-op program. Um, but to your point about whether there's another option, I mean, ANCP was created to, to you know, to um, continue and our commitment to home ownership. So it is the hybrid of TIL. You, as you move through TIL, you get into ANCP and you go into the home ownership mode. The 30-year mortgage, you know, again, when TIL was first designed, the city subsidized the program in its entirety. As we realized that budget wasn't sustainable, we created the Affordable Neighborhood Cooperative Program model. So that 30-year mortgage is something that's going to be there. The idea is to continue to keep the vacancies, to be able to be sold after the building is renovated, and those, the, the money that's generated from selling those vacancies will be used to pay down the private debt that is now associated with the program. Is there money that's reflected in this budget that's dedicated to the capital budget for the TIL and the ANCP program? So the capital budget includes $497.5 million for ANCP for FY19 to 29. Okay. And that, okay, I got it. Um, well, the only thing I'll say, I just have one final question on another topic, but um, just based on the feedback that we're getting at the council and a number of housing organizations, um, there is a lot of displeasure out there about the TIL program, about ANCP, and so while I understand, you know, that you 
um, see the work that your agency is doing. Um, I just want to encourage you that there has to be more done. Uh, there are still 115 buildings left in this program, and in, in absence of ANCP being the only alternative, I really want the agency to look at at doing more. Um, we're getting a lot of feedback from tenants and they're not happy with ANCP. So something is going on and I wanna make sure that whatever deficiencies we have or gaps in the system, we have to fix them because these tenants are not happy and they've lived in these buildings for a very long time. Thank you, Commissioner. This is my second week on the job, but I right. promise you that my team and I will talk internally and welcome talking with you and your staff and other council members to see how we can improve this program. Okay, uh, my last question as we get to Council Member Rosenthal, uh, thank you Council Member for being so patient, mm -hmm. is about the alternative enforcement program. Yes. Um, the 2020 preliminary budget response, we called for $750,000 in baseline funding to be added for emergency repairs for this program, which identified the 250 most distressed multiple dwellings uh, in the city, and as well as performing repairs in those particular buildings. This item was formally under the council um, as one of our initiatives, but last year the administration agreed to pick it up but it was only for a one shot for one year. So my question is, what is the total budget in fiscal 2019 for this program? And what is the long-term plan beyond the one shot? Is this an initiative that the administration will continue to fund uh, beyond fiscal 2019? Thank you, council member, for this question. I would like to ask Eva Trimble, our deputy commissioner for budget. Thank you. So the AEP budget is uh, about $8.6 million for fiscal year 19. Almost all of that is from federal CDBG funding, nearly uh, 7.9 million of that. And the remainder is the, the tax levy funding that you just referenced. Uh, the city funded portion of the AP program is critical to filling gaps where the CDBG funding doesn't allow. For example, uh, work in floodplains, and uh, we received additional funding from uh, OMB this year for ERP work specifically in the floodplain as well. And so we, we work very closely with OMB to make sure we're leveraging the CDBG as broad as we can throughout the program. And then when there are gaps, we work with them to fill that with city tax levy. So uh, we're not concerned long term about the 750,000 as a strategy, but we do work case by case as needed to fill those gaps in CDBG funding. Okay, so is it our expectation that the 750,000 uh, will be continued, right? Um, it's unclear whether it'll be continued long term, but they are, uh, OMB is working with us to fund gaps in the program as needed each year by year. Okay, thank you. I'll turn it back over to our chair. Okay, Councilmember Rosenthal, but let me just say we're also joined by Councilmember Cabrera uh, and Moya. Thank you so much. Welcome, Commissioner. Uh, you've inherited some great staff who, really, who I've gotten to know and really enjoy working with. Uh, so you're lucky in that. I have four quick questions. The first one is about the HPD term sheets. Um, you know, one of the things that I've come to understand over my six years in being in the council and watching what's happening in my district is that uh, there are just so many opportunities for building owners to monetize rent-regulated apartments by lying to the tenants about whether or not they can stay in the program or whether or not their apartment goes to market rate. I'm wondering if HPD uh, has uh, organized in some fashion all of the term sheets that uh, are, are in place right now and historically so that you could know by building, by apartment number, how long uh, that unit is mandated to stay in rent regulation. Thank you, council member, for that question. So. In this administration, we one of our primary goals is to make sure that there's a net gain in affordable housing long term. We've committed a lot of funds and a lot of energy to expanding the housing plan. And um, what we are striving for are changes to rent stabilization program, making sure that there are effective reforms so that our units are properly re registered the right rent is being charged to tenants long term, and that we have quality, affordable housing. 
every one of our um, regulatory agreements require that our units be rent stabilized. And we have an incredible asset management team and legal team that makes sure that these rent stabilization requirements are clearly spelled out in our regulatory agreements. And our asset management team looks at our projects long term. In addition, for a lot of the projects that have tax credits and are bond financed, our partner HDC is our tax credit compliance agency, and they do an incredible job of making sure that they are tracking these units every year, that they're tracking the rents on these units. Uh, developers will lose the tax credits and lose the benefit of the bond financing if they don't comply annually with Last these year, how many units were, did you track and how many units did you find were not continued as rent regulated because the developer did not live up to their agreement? So uh, we track units as well as HDC. So I don't have those numbers today, but I'm happy to come back. So what I'm getting at is this. I have uh, um, rent regulated residents. May I continue, Chair? Yes. Thank you. Um, come into my apartment saying that uh, they don't know, that they've gotten a menacing letter from their building owner saying that their unit, uh, that the tax abatement has ended and they're no longer uh, in a rent regulated unit, it's going to market when that's absolutely not true. What I'm asking is, does HPD have the capacity to send a letter to every single rent regulated unit, perhaps three years prior, two years prior, one year prior to that unit uh, uh, that's been rent regulated to uh, advise a tenant of what their rights are? Do you have the capacity to do that? Do you do that now? And the reason it's so important, and I, I stay on it pretty much every year, is because we are losing these units hand over fist because tenants do not know what their uh, rights are, and they believe the letters that they're, the menacing letters they're getting from their building owners. So thank you, Council Member, for this insightful question. I have personal experience with the type of letters that you're talking about. And um, a lot of them come about where several programs are layered, one on top of the other. And maybe, for example, um, a, a building has 421A that expires in a certain period of time, but the units are also subject to inclusionary housing or another requirement that requires permanent affordable housing. And so sometimes landlords um, send letters out to tenants when one program is expiring. Yeah, my, and they with all due respect, Commissioner, and I need to move on to my second and final question. I'm on the clock, but um, according to my to the resident, I'm losing 500 units of rent regulated apartments a year in my district alone. There's no way that new buildings and new financing can keep up with losses. So when the, the mayor says that he, he wants to preserve this number and build this number, look, God bless him, and, and I encourage and support all of that. It's not keeping up with the number that's being lost every year. And what I'm asking is whether or not HPD can, uh, what tools they have and implement to keep us from losing all of this all of this affordable housing. It's like a sieve. Um, and, and really what I'm saying is I've not seen uh, enough on that side. Um, and I'd, of course, like to work with you to, to uh, get us in a better position. But over the last six years, I've not seen any improvement. improvement. Uh, my office continue to, continues to get calls from developments like 180 Riverside Boulevard, 200 Riverside Boulevard, where there were agreements set in place and uh, the, the residents have no idea that they have right to stay in their apartments. They're being told otherwise by their developer, by the building owner, by the management team. And I don't see what HP is doing to ensure that those residents know what their rights are um, and I think if we just doubled down on that, we would keep people from being harassed and evicted out of their homes and, and, 
and keep them from then moving into shelters, which ultimately is what happens to these people. So this is one of the reasons I took this job. Um, while I was at HPD, we formed a compliance and enforcement unit to do just what, you're, what, what you ask, which is make sure that all of the developers that receive 421A tax exemptions or any other tax benefit and inclusionary benefits Make, make sure that they're telling tenants the right information, that they're properly rent stabilized. And we've done a lot of enforcement actions there. One of the things that I came back to HPD to do is take a look at our asset management and see how we can shore that up to ensure that we do not lose the housing that we're producing and that we make sure that the tenants that are in our housing have accurate information. Great. I, th I think a good way to start, and that, okay, so I'm gonna move on to my next question and last question. Um, I, I'm wondering uh, why, as a council member, I am asked by um, uh, developers to pick up the cost of, um, of social services when HPD is doing a refinancing of a program. So in other words, uh, I have an, a perfect example. Independence House, HPD did a beautiful refinancing with them. Now the social provi service provider is coming to me and saying we need more money for uh, anything, uh, social workers at the building and they're asking the council member to fund $1.5 million for that. They just went through a refinancing. I'm wondering if HPD is not being given the resources it needs in order to do these refinancings so that at the end of the day these social service programs are short funding. Uh, that ha that I have that one on my plate and I've got another one that's about to go through refinancing where also another social service provider is asking that I put up very, the very limited resources that council members are given to allocate funds in, in order to make sure that housing is preserved. Uh, is there a reason, is that a change, is that, part, is that a practice that you do with every council member? Uh, are you not given enough funding to do these refinancing? What's going on? So thank you, council member, for this question. Uh, when we finance a project, we, f we finance the um, construction and the operations for the affordable housing. I'm not familiar with the, the two buildings that uh, you're referring to, but I'd like to ask Molly Park, my deputy commissioner for development, to answer this question. Thank you. Um, so in our new construction programs, when we include homeless set-asides, which is, is, as we've talked about, across the board, we will capitalize a social service reserve up front. We actually just recently released a pre-qualified list of providers to whom developers need to work with somebody on that list to provide aftercare services in those units. So th this is something that we are doing where we can. Um, as I'm sure you're well aware, that we can't use capital dollars to pay for operating expenses. So depending on the structure of the, the particular financing of a particular project, sometimes there's opportunity to do it and sometimes there isn't. But we uh, have certainly heard the concern about making sure that we have appropriate services in the project and when we can structure a deal to make it work with our capital dollars, we do do it. Thank you. I, I'm not it's, uh, I need some help in my district. I, I don't think it's appropriate for the council member to be funding normal services that the city needs to provide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and uh, Chair um, Cornegy has questions. Thank you. Um, so I wanna talk about um, all of the legislation that's been passed on the state and its potential impact on, on the city. So fiscal year 2020 state executive budget released this past January introduced several housing related proposals including major rent, rent regulation reforms, eliminating vacancy decontrol, repealing preferential rent, and limiting building and apartment improvement charges, limiting security deposits to a maximum of one month's rent among other initiatives. These changes were not reflected in the fiscal 2020 state enacted budget but are still being considered in this current state legislative session. Is HPD in communication with the state legislature on these proposals? Yes, we are, and we're working closely with state legislatures on, legislators on this effort. 
So uh, what information, if any, does HPD receive from the division of uh, uh, DC, DHCR regarding the number and location of rent regulated units? Before you answer that, that's a very important question for members of the council. I've been trying uh, diligently to get uh, a robust kind of calculation of the affordable units in my district alone uh, to be able to see where we are. Um, so I'm just wondering, you know, there, there are so many different programs out there uh, that are geared towards affordable housing. Um, I, I wonder if there's a, a relationship between DHCR that um, reveals to HPD what their affordable units are. So HPD does have a relationship with DHCR. There are state laws that protect DHCR's um, unit information for privacy concerns. And so our ability to use that data and also to produce that data is curtailed. But we do have um, our employees and uh, people in various units have the ability to access DHCR data directly in some cases and in other cases to use that data to produce reports. But that data has to be clearly massaged so that it does not violate the state privacy laws. So I'm not going to ask you if you see that as a problem, but I'm going to tell you no. here in the council we see that as, as a problem. Uh, not being able to get a full assessment of affordable housing units in totality, not only in individual districts, but for the city of New York, uh, presents a, a great problem. So, I, you know, I, I go every day um, trying to initiate new programs, trying to uh, work on preservation, not ever really knowing, uh, you know, not ever really having a full assessment of what affordable units are in my district. That's, that's, that's problematic. So we're, we're, we're functioning kind of uh, in an environment where we, ha we don't have the information necessary to assess where we are with affordable housing units across the board. I just find that a little bit problematic. Um, you know, we're in constant talks with DHCR as to how we can access their data and how we can better use that data and give that data to the public. Um, but I, I wouldn't even say to the public, but a council and certainly the chair of housing and buildings <laughs> Uh, you know, should, should be able to have that just to make an assessment um, as to where we're going as a city. I think I find myself on this kind of uh, uh, treadmill running to replace uh, sunsetted programs. To, like, I, like we have that as an issue as well, which I'm sure HPD has. There was a time when I came, when I first came to the council, where we were trying to um, have conversations with landlords with programs that have been sunsetted two and three years, and those, those units were off the market. There's no way you get a landlord to do that. We should be having that conversation three to four years before the program sunsets. So there's, there's, a few, there's a few issues or barriers around sustainable, affordable housing that we should have a discussion about for another time. Absolutely. So there's a discussion of tracking units and tracking units that are coming out of, of um, a regulatory regime, which in order to preserve these units long term, which again, you know, our efforts to do that internally, plus um, rent re regulation reform, there are two areas to tackle this. But there's also the data issue, which again, is a, st is a state discussion. So I, listen, I look forward to being as supportive as I can with my state colleagues around this. I think it's very important um, that if we are who we say we are as a city, yeah. and I believe we are as it relates to preservation and affordable housing, we've got to have the, the right statistics to even base where we are before we can go forward. Because I, I find myself, I, I won't accuse you of it, but I find myself running around almost you know, like a particular animal chasing its tail <laughs> because I don't have the, the, the appropriate information. And it's very difficult to function. Uh, in any sustainable way from that point. Um, so should, out of the aforementioned uh, reforms, um, how would they impact HPD's program and operations citywide so if they were to be implemented? We're excited about this opportunity and we're excited about this conversation about rent regulation reform. What we're looking for from this regulation is to preserve affordability, to stabilize rent levels for tenants, to make sure that tenants are secure in their homes and their neighborhoods, and to protect the rent registration for future units, to protect it long term. And so what we're looking for and we're committed to in this, these discussions is to end high rent vacancy de decontrol, to end the vacancy allowance, and to limit uh, land landlords' availabil ability to take IAIs and MCIs. And so this is 
the, the, um, the content of our discussion so far in the state, and we're looking for all our partners to help us to push for these reforms to rent stabilization. We believe that it is really the cornerstone to anti-displacement. It's the cornerstone to making sure that somewhere in the future we have a net gain in affordable housing, and it really is a cornerstone to protecting um, the city so that all different people of different incomes can live and work and thrive in New York City. So uh, I just want to say in closing that um, I am going to continue to fight um, uh, uh, to, to attempt to get some of the inf information um, that you've said that is protected uh, on a state level. I, I think it's important, and even if we can get it to a place that you know those those people in, in, in high authority, whether in the administration or in the council, can have it not for public consumption, uh, just so that we could do our work more effectively and efficiently, so I'm, I'm going to continue to fight. I, I'd ask that the administration join me uh, in that, maybe I shouldn't call it a fight, uh, I'd ask that the administration join me in trying to solicit for that information from the standpoint that it can make us all way more efficient and effective as it relates to affordable housing. We look Thank forward for to working with you. Thank you. Okay, we have a few last follow-ups. Uh, uh, Chair Gibson, followed by Councilmember Moya. Councilmember Moya. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, thank you, Chairs. Uh, just a quick question: um, Does HPD uh, have a plan to address uh, sort of the the use of low road contractors uh, with a history of wage theft? Uh, and safety violations uh, with the city on subsidized affordable housing projects? Thank you. Okay. So um, I can tell you that we are committed to making sure that um, our contractors pay um, workers appropriately, that our contractors uh, employ safe standards in building and that our developments are being built in the correct way. Um, I would like Molly Park to basically um, answer for the questions on this sure. issue. So we have a structured review process where we look at contractors and subcontractors um, with respect to their performance around labor issues, around safety issues, construction quality. Um, we do not have the abil legal ability to debar anybody, but if a, if a contractor or subcontractor raises any concerns, we post them on our enhanced review list, which is on our website. And if any project comes in that is using an entity that is on the enhanced review list, it has to go through extra levels of scrutiny and we put various different requirements on that project, whether it's uh, escrowing to make sure that, that there's money for labor costs or bringing in a third party monitor. Uh, there's a variety of different tools we have. So, so I ask because as, as chair of zoning, uh, I've done now uh, two major neighborhood rezonings where going to do a third one uh, in the upcoming uh, month. And I have asked for responsible contractor language uh, when you are putting out the RFPs, which the agencies and this administration has uh, said that they would not do. Uh, we have seen time and time again that even though you have uh, a website, you are still contracting with uh, contractors that uh, have a history of wage theft. Uh, uh, fraud, insurance fraud as well. And so I'm asking this question because this is critical as you ask for uh, funding this budget season again, uh, and we're talking about affordability. This city should not be doing business uh, with any contractors that have a history of wage theft or been convicted of insurance fraud, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Council Member. So um, just to, uh, to add to what Molly said, so when we have a contractor on our monitoring list that um, is chosen by a developer to work on our projects, we make sure that if, if there are concerns about past actions of that contractor- well, Why not put it in the, it, why not put it in language? Why not have it there instead of having to wait for someone to report it? So we, we ask for the contractor to hire 
a monitor to monitor Again, on the project? In, uh, right. I'm, I'm saying that we have an opportunity to put responsible contracting language so that we as a city do not operate with funding that will go to contractors that we are contracting as we speak now that have a history of wage theft, a history of insurance fraud, uh, uh, safety violations, et cetera, et cetera. Why wouldn't the agency want to have responsible contractor, contractor language uh, put in? So um, thank you, council member. Second week on the job. I look forward to talking Understood. with you um, in the future and to explore um, your, your ideas about responsible contractor language. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, for indulging me. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Chen. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just want to ask, uh, ask a quick question about the Neighborhood Pillars Program. Um, there's been $275 million in financing that's going to be available. So I want to know how many uh, number of units uh, have been preserved through this program and uh, how much money has already uh, been out there, uh, been made available, and then how many uh, have any like nonprofit organization and MWBE developer, have they participated in the program? Thank you, Council Member, for this question. We are proud and excited about the, the Pillars Program as a way to acquire rent-stabilized units that are not under a regulatory regime and to bring them into responsible ownership of not-for-profits. Um, we've also, we're also excited that we have closed on at least one project under this program, and I'd like Deputy Commissioner Molly Park to tell you a little bit more. Sure. Um, just to echo what the commissioner said, Pillars is, is a really exciting, I think, game changer in the way that we think about affordable housing. We have the, the first building has been acquired. It's a joint venture between a foreign and a nonprofit. We have a terrifically robust pipeline of projects going forward. There's about $75 million a year in the HPD capital budget for Pillars. It's folded into the participation loan program, so it's a little bit hard to see from a, a technical perspective, but it's there. We also have $7.5 million in down payment assistance that's uh, sitting with a nonprofit organization that we work with. That is specifically to help nonprofits participate in Pillars. Um, the $275 million that we've talked about is the acquisition loan, the New York City Acquisition Loan Fund. So uh, to do sort of a very quick overview of how the program works, a nonprofit can come in, they can get down payment assistance out of the $7.5 million, they can get down, then they can get full acquisition bridge financing through the New York City Acquisition Fund and then come to HPD for a takeout and long-term regulatory agreement through the participation loan program. Um, it's it's a, a challenging program to help nonprofits compete in the you know, cutthroat world of New York City real estate, but based on the pipeline that we have, I think it's gonna be really successful. So how many buildings do you have in the pipeline right now? Uh, we have a couple of dozen in the pipeline. A couple of dozen? Yep. That I'm, sounds good. I'm and this also includes unregulated buildings, right? The, the idea is to focus on buildings that are, are sort of lowercase a affordable, so that they are serving low-income households now very often in rent regulation, but don't have an existing city or state regulatory agreement, so that we're, we're turning these um, naturally occurring affordable housing buildings into actually long-term structured affordable housing buildings. Okay, so they, are, they still have to be rent regulated buildings. Yes. I, if we, if we found something that fit the profile that wasn't rent regulated, we'd be happy to take a look at it. We think most of what we'll see coming in, and this has been true thus far, the buildings have been rent regulated, but not subject to an HPD regulatory agreement. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair Gibson, and then we're gonna close it out. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. My final question before we wrap up is related to uh, a Metro IAF plan that was announced last year of a plan to build uh, affordable senior housing on underutilized NYCHA land. There was a commitment of $500 million. As I understand, there is an additional part of this overall plan where six new developments were cited. Um, 
Commissioner Kathy Garcia from NYCHA was here last week and said that in the new part of this plan, there are six new NYCHA developments that were identified and a portion of that will be constructed by HPD. So I wanted to ask your role in that, um, the sites having been identified, is there money attached? Like what does this plan look like and what should we expect from HPD? Thank you, Council Member, for that question. Um, we are excited about our efforts to provide senior housing. The six sites have been identified. One has been RFP'd. It is 19 West 169th Street in the Bronx, and the five remaining sites will be RFP'd um, gradually up to about 2020. So we have plans to RFP some um, this year and some in 2020. So is HPD responsible for all of those six sites or a portion? At this point, I, I, I think my Deputy Commissioner sure. for Planning is better able to answer this okay. question. So I'd like to ask Leila Bozork to come. Okay, I don't know if that's been identified just yet. It's still a conversation. Um, two, two of the sites that were identified are on NYCHA land. Um, for our uh, city-owned properties and HPD's inventory. Um, so it's a combination of city land and NYCHA land, but all six sites will be financed by HPD's new construction finance programs, uh, senior housing program. And if I could jump in on the, the financing programs, we're doing 800 to 1,000 units a year of senior housing, senior new construction dedicated to seniors, dedicated to extremely low income seniors. Those all have project-based vouchers on them so that it uh, serves a population that is extremely low income and, and on a fixed income. I think I, I wanna make sure that I flag that context because I think we've been talking a lot appropriately talking a lot about those particular six sites, but I wanted to go on the record and make sure that we are all clear that it's part of a much larger program and part of a much larger commitment to senior housing development. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your coming today and I appreciate the work you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner. You survived your first hearing. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, we thank you and your team for coming in, and uh, we will follow up with questions later on. Thank you very much. You. We will take a five-minute break and then come back and uh, hear from the Department of Buildings. Bridge the other day and I was looking, I was like, it looks fabulous. Amazing.
Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Housing and Buildings, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Robert Cornegie. We just heard from the Commissioner of HPD, and we will now hear from Thomas Fariello, the Acting Commissioner of the Department of Buildings. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I'll open the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember Robert Cornegie. Good morning. Well, good afternoon at this point. <laughs> um, thank you all for being here. Um, in the interest of time, because we're running late, I am going to forego my lengthy remarks and just pass to my co-chair, uh, Vanessa Gibson. Oh, she, that's right. She's not. Never mind. So let's, let's please begin with your testimony. Okay, so let's just have council swear in the panel. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I, I do. do. Thank you. Okay, you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair Drum, Chair Carnegie, Carnegie, and members of the Committees of Finance and Housing and Buildings. I am Thomas Fariello, Acting Commissioner of the New York City Department of Buildings. I am joined by Sharon Neal, Deputy Commissioner of Finance and Administration, Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner of External Affairs, and other members of my senior staff. The fiscal year 2020 executive budget allocates approximately $199.5 million in expense funds to the department. Of this funding, approximately $154.7 million <coughs> is for personal services, funding 1,852 budget employees, and $44.8 million is for other than personal services. The department is a revenue generating agency and as such is expected to generate approximately $335 million in fiscal year 20 which does not include the more than 70 million in penalties the city is expected to collect as a result of oath ECB violations issued by the department. I would now like to highlight the department's work over the past year. The department continues to make tremendous progress in improving service to its customers and protecting the public by rigorously enforcing the laws and regulations that govern the more than 1 million buildings and 45,000 active construction sites under, under its jurisdiction all while facing a scale of construction unparalleled in the city's history. In fiscal year 2018, the department issued 173,000 initial and renewal construction permits combined, a nearly 5% increase from fiscal year 2017. Of those permits, 111,000 were initial construction permits, and the remaining 62,000 were renewal permits. Despite the slight uptick in construction activity, our plan review times remain well below target. On average, we are com completing our initial plan review for new buildings and major alterations in less than six days, and for minor renovations, less than two days. For plans filed electronically, on average, we are completing our initial re plan review for new buildings and major alterations in four days, and for minor renovations in less than a day. <coughs> These plan review times can be attributed to the hiring of additional plan examiners and the development of plan exam guidelines for a wide variety of projects, which help ensure that plan review is efficient and consistent. Department inspectors conducted approximately 188,000 development inspections in fiscal year 18. Despite the uptick in construction activity, the wait time between a development inspection request and an inspection continues to decrease across the board. The wait time for general construction inspection was under three days, for an electrical inspection under four days, and for a plumbing inspection under two days. Wait times for development inspections have decreased nearly 40% from just two years ago. Progress on development inspection service levels can be attributed to the hiring of additional inspectors and efficiencies gained from the implementation of DOB Now inspections, which allows for nearly all types of development inspections to be scheduled online. Concerning development, the department continues its effort to maintain the city's building construction standards. We are in the midst of committee work to revise the construction codes, which were last updated in 2014. The amendments to the plumbing code, traditionally the first of the codes to be completed, were transmitted to the city council earlier this year. The department expects to transmit the balance of amendments to the construction codes to the city council by the end of 2019. These amendments will bring the city's construction codes up to date with the 2015 International Code Council Family of Codes, 
the national model for construction. The Department is also in the process of revising the City's Energy Conservation Code, last updated in 2016, to bring the City's sustainability requirements in line with Local Law 32 of 2018, which required more stringent energy efficient standards for certain buildings and the NYSERDA Stretch Energy Code. These amendments are estimated to bring 14 percent energy savings to projects complying with, these, with such standards. We anticipate these revisions being submitted to the City Council for adoption this fall. We have also kicked off for the first time in seven years the revisions to the City's electrical code. In all, the Department is managing 23 stakeholder committees with almost 800 members from across the spectrum of those impacted by construction, including architects, engineers, developers, labor representatives, manufacturing associations, and our agency partners. In 2018 alone, committee members met for more than 24,000 hours over 205 meetings, which is a significant commitment of time and expertise to ensure our codes recognize advancements in materials and methods of construction and, protect, and to protect the safety of the public and workers to the greatest extent possible. The Department is also managing an effort to develop a code for structures to address existing and future waterfront structure types in the city. The project has kicked off and will continue over multiple years, with the city's consultant providing recommendations on the development, adoption, implementation of a waterfront code, and agency operations for the city. The department also continues to make progress in responding to complaints from the publicly expeditiously. We received nearly 17,000 priority A complaints in fiscal year 2018. A complaints capture violating conditions that, if occurring, present an immediate threat to the public and include unsafe demolition, building instability, and improper egress. It should also be noted that the Department is now treating complaints that allege that work is being conducted without a permit in an occupied building as an A complaint. While our target to respond to these complaints is 24 hours, we respond to them within 10 hours of receipt and even faster for the most serious cases down 50 percent from nearly 20 hours just two years ago. We also received 78,500 priority B complaints in fiscal year 2018. B complaints capture the violating conditions that, if occurring, while serious, do, do not present an immediate threat to the public. These include complaints of excessive construction debris, cracked retaining walls, tampering with posted notices. While our target to respond to these complaints is 40 days, we respond within 13 days. That's down 70 percent from nearly 43 days just two years ago. As a result of responding to such complaints and our proactive enforcement concerning safety and tenant protection, the Department issued more than 84,000 oath ECB violations, a nearly 75 percent increase from just four years ago. The Department also continues to issue its monthly enforcement bulletins which are publicly available on our website and which detail the Department's actions to sanction and deter bad actors in the construction industry through the enforcement of safety laws and codes of conduct for construction professionals. Last year, enforcement actions resulted in the City's collection of nearly $75 million in penalties as a result of oath ECB violations issued by the Department. Additionally, the Department continues to take action to suspend or revoke the licenses, registrations, or filing privileges of professionals who work unsafely and put their lives and the lives of others at risk. In 2018, the Department took disciplinary actions against 100 licensees, including revoking or suspending the licenses of 10 individuals or corporations. And 22 design professionals either surrendered filing privileges or had them revoked. Notable di disciplinary actions are highlighted in the monthly enforcement bulletin. Construction safety continues to be a focus of the Department. The Department has hired additional enforcement inspectors, increased penalties for safety violations, required safety professionals on more construction sites, and strengthened education and outreach programs by working with industry professionals to raise awareness about best safety practices. Last week, during Construction Safety Week, Department staff visited construction sites to promote safety and hosted an annual Build Safe, Live Safe conference, 
which was attended by hundreds of industry professionals. While the department, while the number of construction-related industries in, injuries, excuse me, increased slightly in 2018, the number of construction-related fatalities has remained the same for the past four years. Such increases in accidents could be attributed to the uptick in construction activity and required safety professionals on more construction sites reporting accidents that have previously gone unreported. Sadly, in early April, there were three construction-related fatalities, the first of 2019. Following these fatalities, the department coordinated a citywide safety enforcement sweep. During a 12-day enforcement sweep, inspectors visited nearly 6,500 work sites across the five boroughs, issued stop work orders at 322 sites with serious safety lapses, issued 1,081 OTCB violations, and distributed over 12,000 leaflets with construction safety information to workers in an effort to promote awareness of proper safety practices. The bottom line is that construction is dangerous and workers and their supervisors need to be trained to ensure that construction work can proceed in a safe manner. The department is hard at work implementing Local Law 196 of 2017, and we'd like to thank the City Council and particularly this committee for its partnership on, important, on the important issue of construction safety. When fully phased in, Local Law 196 will require that workers at many job sites receive 40 hours of safety training and that supervisors at such job sites receive 62 hours of safety training. <coughs> Since the enactment of Local Law 196, the department has, host, has been hosting numerous information sessions for all facets of the construction industry and has also been providing regular updates concerning the law's implementation through a number of different channels, reaching many thousands of stakeholders. Leading up to the second and third major implementation milestones, December 1, 2019, and September 1, 2020, respectively, the Department continues to, perform, continues to perform outreach to stakeholders with the goal of ensuring that all workers and supervisors receive the training they need to continue working safely on construction sites. Additionally, to hold construction professionals accountable for prioritizing safety on their construction sites, the Department launched the new Construction Safety Compliance Unit in 2018. The CSC unit, which when fully staffed will have 50 dedicated inspectors, is tasked with performing proactive periodic safety inspections on all active construction sites, including ensuring that workers and supervisors have the training required by Local Law 196. To date, the CSC unit has performed nearly 11,000 inspections, which resulted in issuance of over 5,000 violations and nearly 1,500 stop work orders. The department is also hard at work protecting tenants living in buildings under construction. Last year, the department, the department implemented over a dozen laws aimed at combating the issue of construction as harassment. As previously mentioned, the department is prioritizing its inspection of work without permit complaints related to construction work in an occupied building, is requiring more detailed tenant protection plan, is performing proactive inspections to ensure the tenant protection plans are being complied with and is auditing more professionally certified applications for work in occupied buildings. The department also launched the Office of the Tenant Advocate over the summer, which serves as a resource to help tenants understand the laws that govern construction and to investigate complaints of construction as harassment. The department looks forward to implementing the, the, the dozen bills the City Council enacted last week, which provide additional measures to further increase protections for tenants. Of particular importance is the ability to shift the burden of creating and submitting a tenant protection plan to the department from owners to contractors. Given that contractors are performing the work, they are in a far better position than owners to determine the means and methods for protecting tenants from construction. This reform will greatly improve the quality of and compliance with tenant protection plans. The multi-year replacement of the department's core information system is also progressing as we continue to shift additional filing types off the mainframe system that the department has relied on for over 30 years to a new browser-based system called DOB Now. Upon completion, customers will be able to perform virtually all interactions with the department online 
and the system will also result in increased transparency both externally and internally. The Department recognizes the, sig the significant impact that, the, that construction can have on the public. As such, the Department has made enormous strides in improving the public's access to its data. The public now has more access to the Department's data than ever before. For example, Building on My Block, which is a searchable online database that is organized by Community Board for easy reference, allows users to search by property address or Community Board to find major projects near them. Over the last year, the Department also released a real-time construction on your block map, which allows users to identify the status of all active major construction projects, and an elevator report, which shows the history, current status, and vital statistics of more than 84,000 elevators. Additionally, in March, we released an interactive building profiles map, which shows the location of each of the more than 128,000 buildings in the city that have had interactions with the department in the past year. The interactive buildings profile map includes information on construction permits issued, complaints generated, inspections conducted, violations issued, and construction-related accidents to which the department responded. We thank the Council for its continued support and look forward to continuing our work together to improve the department for the benefit of all New Yorkers. And we welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, Commissioner, for coming in and for giving testimony. Um, I want to start off with an issue that's big in my district. That is the issue of um, the Coppell Mazda dealership along with the 78th Street uh, Travis Park extension plaza. Are you familiar with that issue? Yes, I am. Okay, so um, let me ask you, uh, what is DLB's role with respect to curb cuts? Um, so curb cuts are filed by applicants to the department, we review it um, based on the billing code and uh, the New York City zoning resolution. We would then approve it and then issue a permit to the contractor and um, do the sign off with inspections at the completion of the work. Do you ever revoke permits? Uh, we do, yes. Under what circumstances? Um, there's numerous circumstances. Certainly, um, if it turns out that um, after it was um, issued approval, um, something was incorrect in the application, someone gave us false information, um, a complaint, you know, would usually trigger that. Um, if it's during permit, maybe they're doing something wrong during the actual installation work. So there's numerous reasons why we may revoke a permit. Do you ever do it for safety reasons? Absolutely. So that's been done in the past? Yes. Okay. Um, how are permits issued for businesses to do reconstruction or renovations to an existing building? So an existing building um, that is just doing, say, an interior renovation or something like that, they would file an alteration application with us. Typically, that would be alteration type two, we call it. So that would mean that the CFO is not being affected. Um, they would uh, describe all the work on the plans. An architect or engineer would submit those plans. We would review them um, for code and zoning. And, um, you know, eventually, if it was all satisfied, we'd approve it. Does an inspector ever go out to look at the building? Sure, on various different applications. Um, certainly, we have two groups where our inspectors are, so we have development and enforcement. So if there's a complaint during the construction or there's some safety issue that's going on or periodic inspections that we're doing, the enforcement unit would be out there. Um, if it was, say, a plumber is asking for a sign-off of the work that they had pulled a permit for and did it, then we'd be out there to do those inspections. In this particular case with the Coppell Mazda dealership, did any inspector ever go out to, to the site before granting it the permit to uh, reconstruct the building? I'd have to check. I'm, I'm, I would sh I'm sure they would have. I, I believe that was a change of use, so um, I, I would say yes, but I have to, I'd have to check. Thank you. Uh, we'll follow up with you on that. Uh, when you um, give a CFO to uh, a, when you have a new when you have a reconstruction like this, do you issue a new CFO? Sure. So, um, as I said, there's all type two application that has no effect to the CFO, and all type one would be that we're, at the end of that job we'd be issuing a new CFO. So that means you're changing the use or occupancy of the building, 
and that or something on the face of your CFO needs to be changed. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's those type applications would be a change in use probably or change in occupancy where we would issue a CFO at the end. Um, is, is, is there ever any interaction between your agency and other agencies upon issuing um, a permit for the construction that's going to occur? Like in this case, was there any interaction between your agency, the Department of Parks, and or the Department of Transportation? Um, I don't believe that there would be for this type of application. Um, we certainly do have touches with many other agencies, so including parks. If there was a street tree, street tree that was required from a zoning requirement or something like that, you'd have to go to parks. So we have those touches. We have, if you're going to be a, having the sewer come into the building, DEP, you know, DOT, we do have some touches with them. But so I don't when know that we would have with this. this particular so there's, is, was, is there any way that, that um, Mazda would have known? that um, there, there's going to be a um, Play Street uh, a plaza program or an extension of the park? Uh, I don't know. I don't know that they would be aware of that. So there's no, no, no way for that interaction to occur? Not a formal way with the Department of Buildings. Can you provide me with a copy um, of uh, the form allowing the curb cut for uh, Coppell? and the date when it was allowed? Sure, we'd have to go back to our records. From what I understand, um, uh, that was issued uh, originally in 1960s, uh, somewhere in that, uh, that area, and I would like to see that. Sure, we'd have to search okay. our archives. There's currently, or there was a, work, a stop work order on uh, this particular site as of 419. Can you tell me why that stop work order was, was issued? I, we'd have to find out. I don't, I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, we're going to follow up with you on that as well. Um, so nobody would have known that there were three service um, entrances to Coppell. Um, I don't understand. So, so, so there are three curve cuts. Actually, actually, there's four curve cuts. Two on Northern Boulevard, one on 77th Street, and one on 78th Street. Your office would not be informed of that when they applied for the permit to do the reconstruction? I'd have to take a look at our survey. So traditionally, they submit a survey that goes in um, with the application, and then that's where they would indicate that. And when a uh, new um, certificate of occupancy is issued, can they increase the number of cars that they are allowed to have from a previous certificate of occupancy? Yeah, as long as it was permitted by zoning, that's, they'd be allowed to do that. That would be part of the plan review as we go through that. And um, if it was permitted um, as per zoning, then that's how the job, that's how it And would where would that be reflected? That would be on the architectural plans. There'd be a zoning analysis. And they would say, you know, what's allowed by zoning and what they are proposing. Okay. Um, thank you for those answers. I appreciate it. Uh, let me talk a little bit about incident reporting. It was recently reported by the press that there were as many as 12 fatalities at construction sites in 2018. Of these 12, only one was reported to the department. Local Law 78 of 2017 requires notification to the Department of Injury and Fatality. Before these articles came out, was DOB aware of the fatalities or underreporting? And if so, uh, what did you do to correct it? So um, when there is an incident that the fire department or the police department is going to any construction site to, normally it's the fire department, they're there, and their first thing is to rescue the worker that's um, either has a fatality or, you know, he, they're, trying to, they're trying to help the person there. And so um, as they're doing that, they're notifying us to come out to the site, um, which we respond um, as fast as we can. So we're not first responders, so we go out and so all 12 of the fatalities um, from last year, we were at the same day as the incident. So how do you find out, Commissioner, about a fatality or even an injury at a work site? Through the fire department and the police department. And so they are coordinating um, through OEM to us. And then once they notify you and you go out, then you initiate an investigation? Yes, that's true. Okay. Um, for years, the council has been requesting that DOB's budget be broken up into more than two units of appropriation. 
uh, one for all its PS and one for all its OTPS. Yet despite our multi-year efforts, there has been no attempt to break up the funding into more transparent buckets. DOB's budget appropriates $154.7 million, or 77.5% of its entire budget in only one unit of appropriation. The other 44.8 million, or 22.5%, is in a second U of A. There is no further breakdown for the entire $199.5 million budget. The administration claims to favor transparency, but this is a prime example of it doing the exact opposite. Why haven't any additional units of appropriation been added to DOB's budget? Hi, um, my understanding is that um, adding additional units of appropriation is a, is a negotiation issue between the mayor's office and the council, so the department defers to the mayor's office of management and budget on this matter. But this is something that we've been arguing for, I think, since I've been in the council. So um, where does your office stand on this issue of transparency? There are plenty of bu budget publications that indicate variations uh, within the department in terms of how it's organized and how resources are allocated just within the unit of appropriation. Yeah, but you know, only two um, units of appropriation really is not transparency at all. So we hope that uh, as we move through this um, budget negotiation process that we'll be able to see more units of appropriation. Uh, I have a few questions relating to the vacancy reductions and headcount, which I understand Council Finance staff asked you before the hearing, but to which they received incomplete information. So I hope you'll be able to answer these questions today. The department anticipates uh, generating savings through vacancy reductions. The Office of the Commissioner will see a, re a reduction of eight positions in fiscal 19, saving $488,000. In fiscal 2020 and beyond, the plan calls for an 85 position reduction in each fiscal year. Could you please describe these vacancy reductions with respect to their titles and their budget codes? So the department um, is currently planning where those positions will be cut. So that started um, internally. So the department's not yet identified where the affected uh, vacancy reduction will occur. And as a preliminary measure, OMB targeted certain positions without our input. The department will be working internally as well as with OMB over the coming weeks to identify the specific positions that will be affected and looks forward to updating the committees further. Um, the department does not expect services to be impacted and will reprioritize existing resources as needed to ensure there is no negative impact to services. So are those uh, uh, reductions going to be in, in enforcement or inspection? We're currently reviewing. We, we've had, as you know, we've had a significant increase in um, budgeted headcount that are tied to specific initiatives. So we're going to have to balance internally how we're hiring for those initiatives, what, what service levels we're meeting currently, and where we're going to be able to um, take those positions from. So you said that you'll um, be making those decisions within the next couple of weeks? Sure. Or a few weeks? Sure. We'll have that before we um, uh, wrap up the budget um, negotiations? I think we have to have it in by uh, July 1st. The budget? Yeah. But will you have that information to the council so that we know where those reductions will be? Yeah, we'll update you when we have it finalized. When will that be? Well, we're going to have to negotiate that internally, so I would imagine within Well, we need weeks. to know before we can have a budget. If you want okay. us to wait till July 1st to have a budget, I think the speaker has already indicated that he's willing. I think the mayor would like to have it earlier, but if you want us to wait till July 1st, you know, because we do need to know this information. Okay. What does that mean? Okay. We'll make sure that you're updated prior to adoption. Okay. Um, the fiscal 2020 budget executive plan includes $4 million in PS savings within the budget code. What are those savings? So these are not savings tied to any particular um, positions. They're one-time PS savings that are generated from underspent personnel services. And um, 
this results when we are funded for positions for either a full year or a half year, and we have not been able to fill those positions. So again, these are one-time savings. It doesn't impact the department's ability to hire or perform these tasks within that um, area where, where you're seeing that reduction. Thank you. Uh, due to the increase in the issuance and adjudication of permit violations, DOB anticipates to generate additional revenue of $8 million in fiscal 2019 and in fiscal 2020 from work without, a permit, uh, without permit violations and elevator inspection fines. How do you plan to in generating the additional uh, revenue and are there specific changes that you're making related to these enforcement efforts? Okay, so the revenue projections based on trends that um, the department, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Office of Management and Budget has identified. So enforcement of unpermitted work has increased in recent years, and the increase is due to additional inspections the department is required to perform as a result of recently passed laws, including Local Law 188 of 2017, which created a real-time enforcement unit which is tasked with expeditiously responding to work without a permit complaints. Additionally, Local Law 156 of 2017 increased penalties associated with performing work without a permit. Um, for the elevator inspection penalties, this is due to improved violation issuance and penalty collection efforts. Uh, due to an increase, uh, excuse me, um, so um, are you going to be able to achieve the revenues even with the vacancy reductions? Yes. Okay. Uh, the fiscal 2020 executive plan budgets for 1,852 positions. Since fiscal 2014, DOB's budgeted and actual headcount has increased, but because there is only one PS unit of appropriation, the council does not have a clear picture of the number of staff in each title or division. So can you please provide the committee with a breakdown of all 1,852 budgeted positions, including the title and division, as well as a similar breakdown of actual headcount and vacancies? Yeah, as I had mentioned before, we have not finalized that internally. As soon as we do, we will share that information to you in the format that you're requesting. Okay. Um, this is another issue that I've brought up on a, on a number of occasions with, um, with, your, with your agency. Um, DLB was required to issue a report to the council and post online by April 1st, 2019, um, subsequent email uh, on, uh, on all gender restroom reporting. Um, so, um, and we've, we've emailed you on a number of occasions uh, to get that information, but we have not received the report. So why has the required report uh, pursuant to the local law regarding all gender restrooms not been issued? Good afternoon, Chair John. Patrick Whaley, Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs. Apologize for the delay in the issuance of the report. We've finished the inspections that are required under the law. We're analyzing that data, and you will have the report this week. This week. Okay, thank you very much. Who in DOB is tasked with leading the uh, required education and outreach to ensure all single occupancy restrooms have uh, all gender signage? The department performs that work in coordination with the Department of Small Business Services, Com Consumer Affairs, and the Human Rights Commission. Is there anyone that is specifically tasked with that um, piece of education within your department? I'd have to get uh, back to you on exactly who that is, but we can provide you with that information. Okay. Thank you. Uh, how many uh, penalties have been imposed for violation of um, sections 403.2.1 and 403.4 .4 of the New York City Plumbing Code regarding single occupant toilet requirements, and what is the amount imposed? I don't have that information with me, but of course that will be included in the report that we issue this week. Okay, thank you very much. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Co-Chair Cornegie. Thank you, Co-Chair Drum. Uh, great to see you, Commissioner. Um, so I am going to ask uh, some questions centered around uh, construction site safety and training compliance. We know that we've moved uh, some dates back. Um, so according to the Department of Buildings, since the construction site safety, I'm sorry, since the, since the construction safety compliance unit was established in September 2018, it's conducted 10,947 inspections. Of those inspections, 75% of sites passed inspection 
and 25% of sites failed inspection. The department has also issued 5,023 violations and 1,436 stop work orders. In your estimation, are violations and stop work orders evenly distributed across the 25% of sites which failed construction site safety inspection? I guess if, if you could explain the distribution part. So do you mean geographically or job type or I, I think that was the part I was a little that's a good question. Confused, so. Um, so, I mean, uh, I'm, 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 I don't know that I have the numbers. That, I don't have them here, but yeah, I'm happy but, to get them for you. But yeah, I you think can, we were thinking geographically. Okay, so we could certainly break them down geographically, no problem. Uh, so that, that's I, a, that's important to, to the though. council. So if we could get that, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, does DLB keep a record of sites and or managers who repeatedly offend? Yes, absolutely, and um, so we're keeping track of that. Um, our construction safety <laughs> compliance unit uses this data to help target where they're gonna go next, right? And so certainly if we're seeing an issue and we're there and he's a known offender, we're gonna be going out there and starting to find out where all their sites are and start to go more frequently to those sites than others. So the, uh, just to be clear, my next question was, what is the current DOB process for handling repeat offenders? And it is to, begin to focus more on repeat offenders in the yeah. event that you see a pattern? Absolutely, and you know, so if even on the same site, we see a repeat offender, you say they're only doing one construction project throughout the whole city, and, and we go out there and we issue violations, and we go out there a couple weeks later and we're seeing the same problems, we will aggravate those penalties and the fines are gonna go escalate accordingly. How many construction site safety violations result in an actual stop work order? Uh, last year, the department issued 3,670 stop work orders related to construction site safety violations. What, what, so what percentage is that? Um, well, we have 45,000 construction sites. So, um, you know, um, these are, we're gonna issue stop work orders on usually your bigger projects. So out of the 45,000 active sites that we have, you know, a lot of them are, are small, you know, interior renovation projects and, and all of that. So I, I'd have to get the number of, um, I would say, major construction projects to the 3,000 and get that back to you. So and of- There are also multiple stop work orders. So we can go out to a site, have a problem, they fix it, and then six months later, we're out there again, and another stop work order. You know, these are our repeat offenders. So that would be included in there. So I can get those numbers for you. Please, I'm, 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 I'm curious about what violations rise to a stop work order. Is there a prescribed egregious behavior that, that generally off the bat re, 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 um, results in a stop work order? Yeah, so you know, when we go out to the site, our initial thing is to protect the public, right? And so, yes, they're doing work on here. We need to protect anyone that's walking by, the neighbors and you know the backyards and, and all of that stuff and so anything that's going to be like safety related where we're endangering the public is going to be a stop work order right off the bat and then within the site if you're not following all the rules you know and all of that protecting your own workers and doing all the laws that we have you know those are going to lead to stop work orders thank you is there a coordinate coordination communication between dob and sbs as it pertains to construction site safety violations and OSHA training outreach? This is obviously an important question since we've moved in a direction of, you know, greater oversight in terms of site safety. Um, it, it would be great to know that there's coordination between SBS in these small businesses, uh, construction site safety, uh, and DOB. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Yes, there, there certainly is. The Buildings Department meets with SBS on a weekly basis, um, oftentimes more frequently than that. SBS also serves on our Site Safety Training Task Force, and we're working with them quite um, heavily in coordinating their efforts to establish a program that's going to provide training to certain groups of people on site safety. Thank you, thank you. Um, so DOB and the Climate Mobilization Act. Uh, intro number 1253C, establish the Office of Building Energy and Emissions Performance at the Department of Buildings as part of the Greater Climate Mobilization Act. Could you please outline any actions the department has taken or plans to take in order to comply with the enacted legislation? Sure, the department worked closely with the mayor's office and the city council um, leading up to the passage of the intro. <coughs> and um, since it's passed, you know, we are working hard um, on the implementation of the law. 
and we're going to be focusing on establishing the advisory board um, that's required by the bill and hiring additional staff to begin this work. You know, DOB is um, one of those agencies that I'm always concerned about capacity. So as a legislator, you know, we, we, can, we can legislate out the wazoo, but I'm always concerned with the agency's capacity, in particular DOB, to implement uh, some of what we're legislating. I'm curious as to whether or not you think that you have everything necessary to implement this latest suite of site safety laws, and if not, what would be required from your um, estimation to be able to uh, effectively and efficiently um, uh, implement? Yeah, I, you know, we share your concern. Um, you know, as, as well intended as a lot of the laws are, um, you know, we look at how we're going to implement this and what do we need to do um, to have that happen and have to sometimes put in a priority of, you know, which is um, one that we can do now or what could we do later. You know, we got to um, try to implement it. So it is a concern of ours. Um, you know, we've been uh, kind of lucky that, um, you know, the mayor's office has been giving us the staff to supplement um, these new laws coming on and, you know, it's our job to get them implemented. And, you know, that being said, you know, sometimes as we go to implement implementation, we thought we needed X amount of people and we see that we're going to need more and, you know, we have to go back and ask and that's not always a fun thing, but that's what we do. So, I, you know, we do share your concern and, you know, we have our core business and then these laws come in and we want to implement them and we want to, you know, as, as you guys write the laws, we want to implement them too, you know, and so it is a concern. So. I mean, for the record, I think we're on the same team, but I know that sometimes, you know, it may, it may not seem that way because um, I think that uh, I'm, I'm in one of the most productive councils and these, these laws and, and advocacy on behalf of the constituents of New York are coming fast and furious. Um, and I know that capacity sometimes directly relates to bodies and employees, but there's other capacity issues that I'd certainly like to continue to have open discussion about, including but not limited to technology and advances in technology, um, the ability to use um, technology effectively and efficiently. So I, I know that obviously the, the low hanging fruit or the most, you know, what seems to be the easiest uh, to implement is uh, staffing. Um, but we're moving in a different direction as a, as a world. Um, and I think that we, you know, as a, as a city have to be conscious of what we could do through technology and how more effective we could be through technology as these, as these new laws come on the books. Um, thank you. Okay. Yep. Uh, questions from Councilmember Moya, followed by Rosenthal. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Uh, sticking with uh, worker safety. Uh, do you know how many construction workers have died since uh, 2017? If you don't know, it's, it's 69. 69 construction workers have died since 2017 in the city of New York. Uh, can you tell me what the qualifications for DOB um, is to define uh, a worker fatality? Um, so, you know, we, we get this a lot. So we are looking at DOB world, right? What is DOB world? It's a construction project that is something that we would permit um, from our department. So if it's a federal building or a state facility that hasn't filed with us, you know, or road construction or something on the waterfront, you know, a pier, you know, those are things that are not um, filed with the department. And so, you know, we are looking at the DOB world and we're concerned with what we can be, what we control. And so that's how we, um, count our fatalities. Right? What, is, what is the DOB's definition that you would classify a fatality in a construction site? Sure, it would be a construction worker that was doing construction work. So, um, for instance, if there is a security guard that had a cardiac arrest and ended up in a fatality, that would not count. Um, if it is a worker that's, you know, doing something unsafe and falls, that's would be one that would be counted. I'm trying to simplify it, but, you know, 
Do you know what the qualifications that are defined by OSHA is at a job site for uh, fatality? Um, I, I don't know off the top of my head, and certainly my folks do, though. So. The reason why I ask is because uh, DOB defines it differently than OSHA, and there is a significant undercount in where DOB is the agency that goes in to look at the accident or work site that is under question. You define it very differently than OSHA does. And so I, my question is, why doesn't DOB use the standard that is set by OSHA uh, that is the nation's agency that is responsible for worker safety, the same be implemented uh, here. Good afternoon, council member. You're, you're correct that there is an undercount. Uh, the first thing I want to say is on our website, we do report the fatalities that are sort of recognized by the buildings department. We also, rec we also report on those fatalities that are recognized by OSHA. The chief distinction isn't about so much the cause of the accident, it's where it's taking place. So for example, if a fatality occurred during street construction, or a building construction. That's the kind of work for which the building's department does not have any jurisdiction over. So we would not report that as a building construction fatality, whereas OSHA would. Uh, understood, but it's still coming from the same job site. And so the, the, the question, and, and Chair, if you can just indulge me for, for um, one, one more minute. It's still coming from the same job site. But not a building construction job site for which the department regulates that work. If it's outside of the premise, of the building, correct? Correct. Right. So, but it's still it's still coming from this job site, right? Where if the worker is just outside of the actual footprint of it on the street, like you said, or sidewalk, and there's a fatality that happens on the sidewalk, what you're saying is DOB does not cl uh, classify that as a fatality on a uh, on that particular job site. I'm not sure the extent to which those types of accidents are occurring. I'm just when using the, the example that yeah, you gave. When, when there is sort of a dissonance between the OSHA re recording of a fatality and the buildings department recording of fatality, more often than not, that OSHA fatality that's being recorded is on a construction site that is not on a building construction site for which we regulate. So it's street construction work, which is outside of our jurisdiction. Or for example, you know, bridge or work that's happening in a factory where steel is being fabricated perhaps. These types of fatalities are not under the building's department's jurisdiction, therefore we don't count them as such. So uh, I know I just, uh, I'm running out of time. I just quickly, uh, I know that you had mentioned the new construction safety compliance unit that started in September 2018. Uh, how many uh, CSC staff do you have currently? Um, currently we have 33 inspectors. Okay, and you said that you, you will be fully staffed with 50. When do you think that would be? Um, we're currently um, staffing up as fast as we can. You know, just in general, hiring inspectors is you know, the industry is, that's where we normally get our inspectors from. Industry is very busy and obviously could pay more than the, the city inspector salary is. So we are always constantly fighting, you know, battling against the industry that we're regulating, so. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Commissioner. Thank you very much. We've also been joined by Council Members Chin and Joe Nye, and now we'll hear questions from Council Member Rosen. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, I, I, thank you. Commissioner, for being here today, Acting Commissioner, really appreciate it. I would like to ask about the Office of the Tenant Advocate, as well as um, your capturing information about billboards and cell phone towers. Just to start with the Office of the Tenant Advocate, um, do you feel that the current uh, staffing with two positions can fulfill the function of the office? Um, in the executive budget, the response, the city council asked for three additional staff people. Um, we, we feel confident with the two because we're also supplementing them and they are working together with other established units within the agency. So we have the Office of Building Marshal, um, we have the borough offices, we have the borough enforcement. You know, we have various other groups that support them. And so we're, we're confident with the two that we have. Um, how, what's the average response time for the Office of the Tenant Advocate to respond to a, uh, a 
a question from a resident. I don't have the exact number with me, council member, but it's something in the order of two to three days. I think it's six, um, according to the public information that we have. Uh, and the next report is going to be released um, this week as well, which will provide additional information with an update to that number. Do you think that uh, you know the city council, as was mentioned, just passed a? Um, uh, package of bills having to do with tenant harassment. Will the Office of the Tenant Advocate take on the responsibility of enforcing those new pieces of legislation? I would say the Office of the Tenant Advocate is going to be playing a role in the implementation of that legislation as it relates to the enforcement specifically. Um, it's going to be working through a number of different enforcement divisions, largely through the Office of the Buildings Marshal and this newly established real-time enforcement unit that are going to be coordinating uh, greatly with the Office of the Tenant Advocate. Is the, um, the real-time enforcement unit fully staffed? No. What, how many filled position out of, and how many vacancies? I'm gonna have to get back to you with that information. How, how many positions are, are there in that group? I, I don't have the numbers handy. I will, um, council member, let you know that um, while this, that the office has not been fully staffed as of yet, um, the office, the real-time enforcement unit is meeting the service levels that are provided in the law in terms of a response for work without a permit complaints. If I could get that information validating that, that'd be terrific. You got it. Okay, thank you. And then about billboards and cell phone towers, um, do you have, does DOB keep a running list of those locations? Um, so when a cell phone tower or the signage files an application, we certainly have those. Um, we have those lists. So we don't keep a running tally, but we could find out how many were permitted by us. Could you do a run to see if um, locations are current in their registration and their registration fees? Regis yes. In other words, uh, do you have a link, you know, internally with the Department of Finance to know that De Department of Finance is getting the, the revenue that it should be getting? I'd have to check with our assigned unit to see if if that's information that we have. I don't know off the top of my head. Okay, do you know uh, how much revenue is collected by the city for the cell phone towers and the billboards? What I can get would be the filing fees that were paid based on the applications. Yeah, I think I, that would be a good start. I mean, I think, uh, you know, uh, we're concerned that um, there are uh, people who maybe register one time but leave the cell tower up there for longer than they're registered for. Are you able to do inspections on that? I'm, I'm not sure about the registration portion because they would file a work application with us. We'd give, and they pay a fee accordingly, and then we give them a permit and then we sign off the job. And so that's the OB's collection mm -hmm. of monies would be at that time. Do they need to renew that application annually or? No, it would only, if they were amending it, adding to it or changing it, similar to like a building, you know, if they were gonna take down their old tower and put a new one up, they would come back for a new application with us and pay start to cycle all over again. How long are the, um, how long are they allowed to keep, let's say a billboard? Is it a payment for a year or is it into perpetuity? No, the construction permit would be to actually uh, install it, erect that up there, and then unless they are changing the copy, um, they wouldn't have to come back to us. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. And if, I'm sorry if I may, Council Member, back to your question about staffing levels at the real-time enforcement unit. 57 positions were funded, and to date, 44 of those 57 have been filled. Any of the 13 part of the hiring freeze or the accruals that you're taking? I'm sorry, what was the question? So you, you in your, I guess your PEG program, you show that you're taking, um, you're, you're reflecting as a savings to your budget, accruals from not hiring, and then I think some of those positions, those accruals have been baselined, 
um, are any of the 13 unfunded positions part of that uh, ongoing uh, not funding positions in 2020 or 2021? Yeah, so um, as I indicated before, this year's reduction is basically just the accruals, not with the positions. But we're being targeted to reduce our headcount by 85, and we're internally discussing where best to evaluate where those cuts can be taken, where it will have a minimal impact on service as well as these priority initiatives that the agency has been given either through these initiatives or through legislation. So we're in the process of, of finalizing that discussion internally and we'll be reporting those numbers back to the department um, as soon as it's wrapped up um, as uh, Chair Drum asked. Right, so just to be clear, I mean, it's my understanding from how the budget process works that by the executive time the executive budget comes out, you know, uh, which, uh, where those positions might fall and which departments would be protected or not, are you implying that the uh, Office of Real-Time Enforcement could be included as some of those ongoing savings that the headcount that is expected there and was agreed to would come down? So there, there were some reductions scheduled, which I believe were, um, not allocated to the correct places. So we would not be targeting real-time enforcement because that's a new unit and initiative that we would need to still staff up. So we're, we're currently going through where the cuts were assigned and we're gonna have to make some technical adjustments to where some of those cuts were assigned. Ah, okay. Yeah. So again, uh, Deputy Commissioner, the total number of real-time enforcement FTEs is 57. So in, you're saying that for 2020, the, the 57 will continue and 21, et cetera, that the goal will always be to have that unit filled with 57 full-time equivalents. That's not being touched. Next year, it won't be 55. So we would, again, we would be not looking to take reductions against priority programs, but again, based on whatever workload is coming in and how we're able to manage that service um, and targets, we're always gonna have to evaluate and manage the resources internally. So I can't say that, that we would never target real-time enforcement years from now. We're still in the process of staffing up. I just asked about next year. I don't oh. say 10 years from now, 2020. We're, we're, tr we're trying to hold all of the priority programs harmless at this point. And this is a priority yes. program? Yes. Okay, I think that's something the council will want to track on an ongoing basis. Um, should it become the case that you'll be taking cuts in that division, permanent cuts, that's something we'd be in interested in knowing about. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Councilmember Joe Nye, followed by Councilmember Chin. Thank you, Chair. I'm, I'm just going to follow up a little bit based on those hiring freeze numbers. I'm just looking at the fiscal 2019 DOB headcount between the budget and the actual. You had 253. 2000, fiscal 2018, over 100. Fiscal 2017, over 130. So the head counts that, the freeze that you're referring to, you have plenty of vacancies already, 13% from what I can tell in staff vacancies. We shouldn't be worried about cutting any of those priority projects that require personnel. So just to understand the numbers that you're referring to are vacancies at the end of the year? Mm. So many, many positions that were allocated to the department have been allocated over the time for priority programs. So we all oftentimes have to manage making sure that the budget is being made whole at the same time that we're trying to, to recruit. And that's been a real struggle in this very competitive job market. But again, going back to the headcounts, You've budgeted for 1,857 positions, but your actuals were 1,604. That's 253 vacancies. I just want to reiterate that 
I, based on those estimates, we shouldn't be worried about any key personnel being cut due to uh, hiring freezes. Again, many of the positions that were allocated to the department were specifically targeted to hold certain pro programs with targeted service levels, and we're going to have to evaluate whether or not some of those expectations. You have wiggle room. Yeah, of course. We have plenty of wiggle room, from what I can see. Right. Okay, great. My next question then is going to be on the um, one of the re estimates is on a lease adjustment of 257,000 for fiscal year 2020 uh, and in the outer years for costs associated with lease space. Does anyone even know how much vacant space we have in our properties and which location is this for? Is this spread across the city? Uh, this is just for the Department of Buildings. Mm -hmm. So I oversee facilities and I can guarantee you that we are very aggressive in utilizing and maximizing the space that we have. So um, we do not have much vacant space currently. And obviously with many of the programs that we've been funded and trying to time when we're gonna hire people have been trying to utilize as much space that we have allocated to us that city owned space and then also some of the small lease spaces that we have. So we've been reconfiguring to make sure that we're utilizing everything as efficiently as possible. Chair, can I continue the question? When was the last time there was a physical inspection made of actual occupied and vacant spaces when it pertains to the Department of Building Facilities, whether it be through city-owned property or leased property? So we work very closely with DCAS, and DCAS has also done numerous walkthroughs in the past year. Are you familiar with the last walkthrough, and was it a complete walkthrough, or was it a pool of samples? I'd have to check because they, they conducted the walkthrough. I'm really curious because I speculate that we're going to find quite a bit of unused space. Um, and this is just not a DOBs. Uh, this is across the board um, at our own property, city-owned property, as well as those properties that we're leasing from private ownership. And I was startled to see some of the vacancies that we have at our own properties and within a short distance, we were actually leasing additional space. So I'm going to be focused on this in the upcoming weeks and months, and I'm hopeful we'll find um, ways that we can continue to spend our tax dollars more wisely and be good stewards of taxpayer dollars. My last question for you is on basements and the illegal occupancies that we currently have. And, Earlier, we spoke about a pilot program in Brooklyn where we're legalizing basements and come up with a pilot that'll help those property owners legalize and bring those basement. I've, they've also been referred to as, not my saying, and I just want to point it out there, undocumented apartments versus illegal apartments. And I don't say that as, in any way as an intent to insult anyone with the immigration status. But this particular classification of undocumented apartments versus an illegal apartment is one that has substance. In the 60s, New York City went out and evaluated every private home. And I believe if you had a half a bathroom and a kitchen, your property was increased on the tax break, the number of units. So you went from a one family home to a two-family home if you had a semi-finished basement. Am I correct with this? Um, I believe you're talking about whether your taxes were increased. Right, real estate taxes. That was based on a DOB inspection, though. I don't know about that. <laughs> okay, so let me just reiterate. So in the 60s, citywide inspections took place. If you had a semi-finished basement, your number of units was adjusted. You went from a legal one family to a legal two family, and you were taxed accordingly to the number of units. Thus the case about undocumented apartments. We had ta homeowners paying a tax rate for illegal apartments that the city was benefiting from. And as those properties turned over 
and they were inherited by family members where there was no, no search for a CFO, when they received their quarterly real estate tax bill, it showed that they had a legal two-family. And they believed that they had a legal two-family because they were being taxed as a two-family dwelling. Jeopardizing themselves, their single investments, and those occupants of those apartments that in many cases are death traps. So I'm going full circle. We allowed for something to continue for decades. We benefited from it through the taxes that we collected from it. They're illegal and dangerous. What are we going to do about these conditions that are jeopardizing the residents where there's no second means of egress and the homeowners which truly believe in their heart of hearts that they have a legal apartment. And this goes, this happens more often than you think. And I can only bring my own experience in. For a number of years, I was a real estate broker. And most of those homeowners only found out at the time of sale that their CFO dictated otherwise after paying for decades. So let me take two parts. So um, the first part about with well, the taxes being increased to a two-family, uh, I mean, you know, we are the agency that um, determines the lawful use of the building. And mm -hmm. so if the building had a CFO, um, you know, or they're coming in for a two-family, then we would certainly review it against the building code and the city, the zoning resolution and all of that. Um, we do have a number of homeowners come in thinking that they have a two-family house. You know, the finance information says two-family, and we look at our records, and it indicates a one-family. And, you know, a lot of times that is news to the homeowner. Um, not happy news, obviously. But, um, you know, that is the lawful use of the building as a one-family house. Now, whether they've been taxed that um, or not, that's not the Department of Buildings. You know, we don't do that, and that would be fine. No, but you, you have access to information that we can cross-reference with the tax department. So here we see a flag. And I don't think it would take much for us to cross-reference the number of dwelling units between what your records have and the Department of Tax and Finance is charging for real estate taxes. This way we could better inform those homeowners. Well, hell, we could inform those residents that live in these apartments that they're occupying potentially the illegal but dangerous dwelling units. Don't we owe this to our citizens to protect their safety as a priority and then the homeowner to let them become aware that potentially they have a real problem on their hand? So, so we have a quality of life unit um, that's headquartered out of Queens because that's where the majority of the complaints that come in. And what we find out is our biggest issue is getting access into the apartment. You know, maybe finance sees that hey, there's two bells on the thing, and we're going to raise their taxes to a two-family, and if they don't come in to grieve the taxes, well, that carries on, on, and on, and on. And so we just legalized something that was illegal. No, I'm just saying they paid their But we're taxes, charging for it. Right? And so, you know, our, our quality, quality of life unit goes out to these sites. They're looking for any, you know, obviously they're asking to get into the building. We not, you know, this is America. We're not allowed to storm our way into the building. We still have laws that we have to follow. And then if we see that there is, you know, evidence of a two-family going on there, we will then, and they're not giving us access, then we'll apply for access warrant. And we've been doing that judiciously over the last, you know, four or five years to gain access, to, gain, to get into more and more buildings than we can. But our, our biggest problem is gaining access into these so great. How undocumented ma apartments, as you say. How many, how many warrants have, did we do all of last year? I'd have to get the numbers. I think it's 283, close to 300. How many illegal apartments do you think exist citywide? Oh, I have no idea. Hundreds of thousands. How many complaints did we receive on illegal occupancy? 311 calls. And that ratio is going to be much, much higher than the 200 apartments that you actually applied for a warrant and the ones that you actually got into. We'd have to look at the numbers. My point is, I really want to work on this with you, and I, and I truly appreciate the work that you do. 
But when it comes to New Yorkers, they don't want to hear, well, we're just DOB. And, you know, we can tell you the legal, the CFO uh, that your property has, but we have nothing to do with the Department of Finance. We, they deserve better. And this is something that we should be working on. We should be proactive, not reactive. I can't tell you the number of times I went to a closing where after contracts were signed did the homeowner realize that they don't own a two-family or a three-family. It was actually a one-family or a two-family. And they portrayed it in the sale, which became a real problem. But not only that, they risked their single largest investment. And those residents, I go back to the priority, the health and safety and well-being of those occupants. And I think we can do better. And I think that we can actually work on serving New Yorkers and what's in their best interest. And we can do this with the Department of Finance and the DOB and actually hum up those red flags. And let's apply for more warrants. That would be a great indication that your CFO says one family, but you have a two-family dwelling on your taxes. We know there's some kind of violation going on there. So if we can't get in there, I think a warrant is warranted. Can I get a commitment from you to work on this with me? Sure, we're happy to work with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councilmember Chin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First one, I'm just curious about the DOB now. Um, that is really one of your only new needs uh, for the fiscal year 2020, and you're adding uh, four new positions. So how many people are, what's the total headcount that is designated to this DOB now uh, online electronic self-service plan submission? Good afternoon. Uh, so right now the plan is providing for four additional new staff for next year and um, those positions primary function are gonna be to provide ongoing maintenance and production support for DOB now. And there are currently seven staff performing DOB now function, and that includes business analysts and programming positions. So does that replace the traditional plan review? It's supposed to be faster so that you can review more plans? No, this is staff that's um, dedicated to um, creating the system, right? It's more like IT staff that are doing this. So the plan review team are gonna use this program Right, but this staff, um, four and seven, 11 total are gonna be for creating the software. And, you know, obviously with consultants, um, a lot more consultants to help us, but they're the ones that are dedicated for doing the requirements for what the, the department needs to create the system. But the plan re examiners are gonna use the system, they're users. So is this program up and running now? Um, it's partially up and running. Um, I believe we have six um, work types that are ongoing right now. We keep adding more and more. So is this generating more revenue for the department because you're able to um, kind of review the plans quicker when they submit it electronically? I think um, right now it's the same revenue, the same application fee that would come in that we would do in our old system that we're doing a new system. Um, it's gonna help us be more efficient it's gonna help us be more transparent. Um, applicants, owners, um, contractors can see where they are and you know, where they are in, in place, where they can't see that now. So they know, they will know um, where they are in each step. So if I'm an owner and the plumber's saying, hey, I didn't ask, you know, when are you gonna inspect this thing? He says DOB's not doing their part. The owner can go in the system and see that he didn't even request it, you know, or something like that, you know, or the similar an architect, you know, you know. The so owner. how so how soon are you gonna be able to have this uh, sort of replace the your traditional system yes, of so reviewing plans? The system of reviewing plans is one part of it. So there are licensing. So anyone that comes in for a license with the department, you know, they're gonna use this system also. When we have reports that come to us annually, boiler reports, facade reports, they're gonna use this system where. They didn't have a system before. And then we have the plan review portion of it. And then we have the inspection piece that's up and running now. So it's four pieces that are to it. 
in order to make up, make up the whole system. So it's a multi-year thing. And so um, I believe it's, I think it's two more years we're gonna be um, with the operational piece of build, right? That's what we call the plan review portion of it. Okay, just one last question because of time. Um, in terms of number inspector, um, uh, one of the big issues that we have, especially in my district, is the scaffolding staying up for a long time. Sure. Uh, so my question is that when they apply for a permit to put up a scaffold, and if they keep extending it, I mean, does DOB send out regular inspectors to see why you know, there are delays? Because like some scaffold has been up for years, and like, yes, you, know, you have to do the, the, the work on the, the required to do, but like, you keep dragging it out. There's gotta be stiffer penalties or inspection that the, the owner who's doing this has to be responsible. So, so we have a scaffolding unit that's dedicated just to looking at the safety of the scaffolding itself when it goes up and obviously, obviously when it comes down or if there's an incident on there. Um, looking at the reason why it's up there um, is a little more uh, complicated than you would think. So, you know, we're out there, you know, we're looking at making sure that the scaffolding itself is safe, that it's gonna do its job and protect the public and all of that. And so, if the owner is not doing their part to fix the facade or whatever caused the reason why you put it up there, um, that's the part that's a little more nuanced than, and so we are trying to find ways where we can get the owner to fix the building and get the scaffolding down. And so that's been an ongoing thing for a number of years now. So we are trying to find ways to um, get the owner to do the work and then the scaffolding itself can come down. Well, we look forward to continuing working with you on that because we're looking at you know, legislation, but we want to work with the Department of Building because there are all these problem cases where the scaffold stays up there for years and years, and this, something's got to be done about that. So hopefully we can uh, work together on, on some legislation or plan that could make it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, and uh, with that, we are uh, going to end this portion of our hearing and say thank you for coming in, and uh, we look forward to continuing to work with you uh, as we move along. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. And with that, we'll start our um, immigration uh, committee hearing at about 2.30. Miss us? <laughs> All right, well, good to see you. Yeah. 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 Hi, how are you? Good to see you. Okay, all right, good. We'll follow up. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, two thirty for immigration. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Grab something. 
Shed, you know. There's no place there. There's no performing space there, is there? Yeah, I know, yeah. All right, all right, Margaret. Oh. <laughs> I don't like lox, but bagels I love. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> so no, I just wanted to give you that heads up because it's like, I'm 
Thank <laughs> you. 
How's it going? Good. Are you texting? I'm not sure what you guys are doing. Um, I haven't really kept up with it. No, 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 that's not me, no. I'm like, wait, what? I was, I was like, wait, which? <laughs> so no, much happening. Yeah, um, no, no. Um, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, it's like, like kind of like terrified of you. And oh, nice. Like oh, nice. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. We're going to be presenting tomorrow at the Emma Gibson. It's looking good. I mean, I think. The mayor Uh, yeah. Like yes, but the problem is it's not extending to our initiatives. Right. It's so that's the only like hang up that we're gonna have to negotiate. Have no, we don't. Yeah, because the problem is like, and I had to have this conversation with Latanya because we were under the impression it's not it's not an issue anymore. Like, you know, once it came out, we were like.
Okay. Okay, we will now resume the City Council's hearing on the Mayor's Executive Budget for Fiscal 2020. The Finance Committee is joined by the Committee on Immigration, chaired by my colleague, Councilmember Carlos Manchaca. We just heard from the Acting Commissioner of DOB, and now we will hear from Bita Mustafi, the Commissioner of the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. In the interest of time, I will forego an opening statement, but before we hear testimony, I will open up the mic to my co-chair, Councilmember Manchaca. Thank you, Chair. Drum. Uh, in Buenas tardes to everyone here today and at home listening. My name is Carlos Benchaca, Chair of the Committee on Immigration. Uh, and I want to thank Chair Drum for holding these executive hear hearings. It's an incredibly oppor incredible opportunity to get another uh, understanding, a deeper understanding as we negotiate this budget, specifically on immigration. Now today we will focus on the administration's funding for services and programs that serve immigrant New Yorkers. Every year I stress this, but I cannot stress this enough, immigrants make up the fabric of our city. There are over 3.3 million foreign-born immigrants who call our city, this city, their city home. And our immigrant community hails from more than 150 countries, comprising nearly 40% of the city's population. 40% of the city's population. This diversity is our strength. Yet the de Blasio administration's record on supporting immigrants and their families has been inconsistent at best, and this year's budget is no exception. On one end, the mayor expands his collaboration with ICE, and on the other hand, he rolls out NYC Care Card, which will primarily impact immigrants, amid concerns regarding IDNYC adding the chip and capabilities with this technology. I expect that today we will get some clarity on a number of budget proposals and programs that will impact immigrant New Yorkers. And this includes clarity on the 2.4 million added for IDNYC renewals and its rollout, insight into why adult literacy was not baselined after a repeated year-to-year -year call for it uh, beyond fiscal 2020. More information on NYC care and its expected impact across the city an update on census operations and Moya's involvement in translation at poll sites, and information on local and national efforts to protect immigrant New Yorkers from federal government. Given the systematic assault on our immigrant communities, this is why it's all important that the administration and the city council continue to lead the way in making sure our most vulnerable residents' needs are met. The budget is an essential tool in making sure we can meet these needs of our immigrant New Yorkers. So before we go and start this hearing, I would like to thank our committee staff who helped prepare us today and the unit head, Acrillian Francisco, to my right here, and com uh, committee counsel Harbani Hoja to his right, policy analyst Elizabeth Cronk, community, community liaison Stella Chan, and my staff, uh, chief of staff, Soshi Meng, and my communications director, Tony Chirito. Now I would like to welcome the commissioner of the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, uh, Commissioner Mustafi. Please come up. Thank you. And I'd like to ask Council to swear the Commissioner in. Do you affirm that your testimony will be truthful to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? I do. Thank you. You may proceed. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you to Chair Drum, um, Speaker Johnson, Chairman Chaka, and members of the Committee on Immigration and Council Finance. My name is Beach Mustofi. I'm the Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Moya is tasked with promoting the well-being of immigrant communities in New York City. Our focus over the past fiscal year has been to ensure that immigrants have access to and feel welcome engaging with the city and the city services. Even in the face of relentless attacks by the federal government, Moya has worked to strengthen and innovate programs for immigrants, address policy challenges, and coordinate the city's response to critical federal policies impacting our residents. In close co collaboration with our sister agencies, Moya has provided timely, crucial information to our affected communities to both empower and arm them with the necessary tools that they need and organized interagency and intercity advocacy. My testimony today will outline the environment that Moya and indeed everyone working on immigration and with immigrant communities are facing. 
highlight investments in the executive budget meant to advance the well-being of immigrant New Yorkers in the coming year, and touch on some of the successes for the last fiscal year in addressing our goals for 2020. As has been widely reported, the Trump administration has redoubled its bigoted attacks on immigrants, including here in New York City. Moya's own analysis has found that in the New York City area, ICE has dr drastically increased its arrest of immigrants, including long-term U.S. residents with no criminal convictions. Total ICE arrests increased 88% in the first full federal fiscal year under the Trump administration compared to the last of the Obama administration. This included a 414% increase of arrests of individuals with absolutely no criminal conviction. ICE agents also made arrests in and around courthouses in New York City and across the state, which can have chilling effects on immigrants' access to justice and trust in the, in the judicial system, including by dissuading defendants, victims, and witnesses from coming to court. In addition, the federal administration has proposed new changes to several longstanding policies. This includes the proposed change to the almost 20-year-old public charge test, which could have devastating effects on those in the U.S. who are applying for a green card. Following similar changes to the State Department's public charge test for visa applicants applying from abroad, there's been an over 300% increase in public charge denials in the past year. While this is due to the amendments made to the Foreign Affairs Manual's public charge inadmissibility procedures, this is an indication of the potential impact that this proposed rule could have for those already in the U.S. should it ever be implemented. The city is not alone in its concerns. New York State has also been active in responding to the needs of immigrant communities. We are heartened by the Office of Court Administration's decision to take steps to keep courts open to all, which mirrors the city's own work to ensure that all New Yorkers feel comfortable coming to and from city property. Similarly, the passage of the New York State DREAM Act has opened up financial aid for thousands of New Yorkers, including in New York City. We're eager to work together with the state advocates and other stakeholders to ensure that all eligible New Yorkers can access state financial aid and scholarships for higher education. Passage of the DREAM Act was a critical step in building a just and inclusive society, one where all students have a chance to succeed. In addition, the city's investments in conjunction with the states for the 2020 census represent a significant step towards ensuring that all New Yorkers are counted. Highlighting just a few of the new investments that are present in the executive budget, I'm pleased to note that the administration has added funding in several areas intended to support immigrant New Yorkers. First, as a part of its work to ensure that New Yorkers with limited English proficiency can be engaged in our democracy, the administration has allocated $1 million for the Pulsite Interpretation Project. This is in addition to another recently announced 640,000 investment for a total of 1.64 million for interpretation services at poll sites. In addition, the executive budget includes dedicated new funding for language access to increase the capacity of agencies through technical and other supports. This is alongside an additional centralized staff line to work exclusively on interpretation and translation services. Language access is a fundamental part of Moya's work, and in addition to the increased staffing for language services, the funding for language, ac language access staff and pulse site interpretation will help address the needs of the nearly 25% of New Yorkers with LEP. Second, the administration has put forth significant funding for Census 2020 outreach and awareness. For fiscal year 2020, the administration has allocated an unprecedented 20, 22, sorry, 22 million for census outreach, education, local capacity building, and communications. In conjunction with the four million already allocated in fiscal year 2019, the $26 million total invested in the census by the city will help ensure that every New Yorker is counted in 2020. Third, the city continues to prepare for the summer launch of NYC CARE starting August 1st in the Bronx and operational throughout the city by the end of 2020. Across New York City, approximately 600,000 residents, including some 300,000 people who are estimated to be undocumented, lack health insurance or affordable health care. Under the mayor's leadership, we're investing $100 million annually to ensure that no New Yorker will go without primary care provider or specialty care. The city recently released a request for proposals for the outreach work for NYC CARE program, 
which will distribute more than uh, 450,000 to community-based organizations in the Bronx. As Moya prepares for the rollout of NYC Care Program in the Bronx this summer, we're excited to partner with community-based organizations in engaging uninsured New Yorkers to ensure that they understand the support available to them and are able to learn how to enroll. Finally, I want to highlight the administration's 2.4 million investment for IDNYC in anticipation of the first renewal period fast approaching in January of 2020. We are in the process of developing an efficient and easy to use renewal system and we'll have more to share soon. These new investments are in addition to the administration's ongoing support for key programming for immigrants, which ranges from IDNYC, our legal initiatives work, We Speak NYC, and more. I will speak about these successes now. As the city's expert on immigrant communities and immigration policy, Moya has long coordinated and supported on a broad set of issues, recognizing the sheer diversity of immigrant New Yorkers' demands, an equally broad and, and diverse approach. Throughout the last year, Moya has engaged in a variety of programs and activities in advance of the well-being of immigrant New Yorkers. Some notable accomplishments not yet discussed in my testimony include providing a continuum of free legal service programs for immigrant New Yorkers, this work with our sister agencies, including HRA's Office of Civil Justice, to respond to new needs created by a fast-paced federal climate. As one example, the city allocated $4.1 million to provide legal services to migrant children in response to the family separation crises. As another, the city recently added $1.6 million in emergency funding for NIFEP to respond to recent changes in court process at the Varick Street Immigration Court. We advise and support agencies in the implementation of Local Law 30, the city's language access law, track compliance with Local Law 228, which prohibits the use of city resources to support immigration enforcement by monitoring and collecting information about any requests from non-local law enforcement agencies related to immigration enforcement, support the city agencies in the effective provision of U visa certifications and T visa declarations, respond to inhumane and cruel proposals from the Trump administration, including public charge and the census, provide agency partners with additional tools and resources to support their work, serving New Yorkers, including through the interagency task force, increase access to IDNYC for minors by allowing 10 to 13 year olds applying for the program. We've increased capacity of our We Speak NYC program by delivering new tools and classes for LEP New Yorkers, which we notably won an Emmy for this uh, two weekends ago. Share information with our 12,000 uh, with over 12,000 folks and refer over 3,000 through our in information desks. Respond to five, over 500 calls through our hotline and, th and 311, providing nearly 657 referrals. Advocate for and provide support to US citizens uh, here and abroad seeking support for uh, their children through visas. Additionally, we've trained CBOs and launched our Know Your Rights programming targeting low-income immigrant New Yorkers. Moya's efforts will continue to ensure that immigrants are included in every aspect of the city's work. We will continue to innovate new and existing programs. First, in fiscal year 2020, we'll expand our work to increase cultural and linguistic competencies in the delivery of critical services and benefits across city agencies and within immigrant communities. As we prepare for the possibility of federal barriers to access for crucial public benefits, we'll work closely with our sister agencies and community partners to build on our programs and more efficiently and effectively connect New Yorkers to services. Moya will build on its successes with our legal services programs to ensure greater efficiency and stability and to ensure the program's lasting legacy. Toward that end, in partnership with the Office of Civil Justice, we will soon release a concept paper that serves as a precursor to a forthcoming request for proposals for Action NYC with the goal of beginning contracting in fiscal year 2021. Moya will also work with our partners at HNH as the city implements the mayor's new NYC care program. The city is committed to providing access to health care for all uninsured New Yorkers, regardless of status. And as the RFP process continues, we look forward to working with community-based partners to ensure that the uninsured in New York are eligible for the program, are aware and able to enroll. 
Second, in the face of increased arrests and deportations, we will work to strengthen community protections against deportations by effectively connecting individuals to legal services and their rights education. Moya is also fighting against unscrupulous individuals who prey on fearful immigrants in this time of crises. By providing resources for immigrants at risk of fraud, as well as rights education, helping to advance economic justice for vulnerable immigrant New Yorkers. All New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, play a critical role in our city's future. We will work to expand democracy to encourage all New Yorkers to participate in our civic life. We will accomplish this goal through community town halls, cultural celebrations, and more that provide opportunities for communities to engage with the city while simultaneously connecting them to information and access. Additionally, Moya will continue to expand poll site interpretation services to help ensure that every citizen can have full access to voting regardless of language ability. Finally, in fiscal year 2020, the city will use all of the means at its disposal to defend our residents against anti-immigrant policies from the federal government. We will advocate for common sense, pro-immigrant policies at the state and national levels. We're committed to ensuring the safety and security of all New Yorkers, especially in their interactions with the city. In coalition with and across our sister agencies, we will work to better serve immigrants and realize greater equity and fairness for all. I want to thank the committees and the entire council for being a crucial partner in the fight to advance the well-being of immigrant New Yorkers in New York City. Without your help and the help of the many community-based organizations and service providers that we work with day in and day out, this is not possible. You have our commitment to continue to listen to immigrant New Yorkers, monitor and understand the impacts of anti-immigrant policies, and work towards making New York City a city for immigrant communities to flourish. I'm happy now to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, thank you for your testimony. It's always good to see you. Thank you. Let me start off with um, something that's very dear to my heart, which is the IDNYC renewals. Um, the fiscal 2020 executive plan includes $2.4 million for the anticipated card renewals for the IDNYC program. Yep. How many cards do we expect to renew in fiscal 2020? And will the renewals uh, be uh, executed similarly to the rollout of IDNYC, uh, for example, with pop-ups across the city? Thank you so much for the question. And as I noted in the testimony, we will have a lot more to share with you really soon. We're working through um, some final pieces that we want to be able to brief uh, both you, Councilmember Drum, and Chairman Chaka spe specifically as the bill sponsors for the program and our lifelong partners on it. Um, so um, to answer your question, the first year of the program was, as you know, remarkable. We enrolled approximately 750,000 New Yorkers in its first uh, year. Um, accordingly, we are planning for the ability to be able to not only uh, execute as many renewals as New Yorkers will invite, but continue our ongoing operations in inviting new New Yorkers to enroll for the card. That's a tremendous undertaking, as you can imagine, um, which is why you see the increased budget allocation um, in the budget. We anticipate both op operational needs, um, uh, production needs and staffing needs to be able to appropriately address that. We are building out technological capacities and others, um, and we'll have much more specific details to share with you very soon. Okay, thank you. In the uh, fiscal 2020 preliminary budget hearing, you alluded to the administration being in the exploratory phase on the proposal to include CHIP uh, capabilities in the IDMYC cards. The council and many advocates have expressed concern over the proposal, as you know, um, but do we expect the renewal cards to be enhanced with the CHIP? Uh, and if so, what has changed to, um, um, to mitigate the council's and advocates' concerns? Yeah, thank you for that question. We're in ongoing conversations both with you all and with advocates um, and have not made a final decision. We've not completed conversations with um, entities either, so there's no final decision on the inclusion or exclusion of a, of a chip. We're moving forward with a renewal plan because we need to, to be able to effectively execute on the renewal within the timeline, but have in response to the concerns and really in also my interest in getting this right, not made a final determination on the chip. When do you expect to start with the renewals? Um, we will 
hopefully announce that soon. Um, we will we will not we will start earlier than January, obviously, um, to give people a head start whose cards will be expiring in January. Um, uh, and accordingly, we'll start to roll out new information um, by no later than the fall. Okay, so in a, re in a recent speech, uh, Deputy Mayor Thompson expressed the administration's desire for community groups and unions to learn how to use big data from the IDC uh, chip card to organize people and to do collective consumer purchasing and bargaining with corporations and utilities. What new data would the administration be able to access from the IDMYC card with the smart chip? And how will this data um, aggregate in aggregate form inform city initiatives and programs? Um, so one of the things that we've consistently done with the program is essentially this idea of collective bargaining, right? So we have things like your Big Apple RX discount on the back of your card. We have things like a Food Bazaar discount. These are things that have yielded significant savings for New Yorkers. Food Bazaar, I believe, over two million at this point. The Big Apple RX, nearly a million dollars. Um, and so one of the things that we've talked about is um, having aggregate data of how IDNYC cardholders use their card as a way to understand what we can um, effectively get for them in terms of additional discounts or memberships or things like that. So that's one of the pieces of the things that we've been looking at with this. It would, of course, be not information that the city would hold, but if, you're, you, if you would be using your um, IDNYC or you would choose to use your IDNYC to conduct a financial transaction, um, one of the things we've looked at is could we understand sort of on a kind of aggregate level how our cardholders using their card to see if there are ways that we could bargain for discounts for folks. So uh, what information would be provided to the cardholders about how that information is being used? Um, so as you know, we're in ongoing conversations around this, right? Um, so I don't know that one, we've even settled that this is what we would do, um, and two, um, that if we were to do it, that we yet have honed sort of how we would ensure that cardholders knew that this was an intention of the program. One of the elements that we've noted consistently that we're interested in is just ensuring that regardless of what we do, there's robust consumer education attached to it so that individuals know everything about what they would be connecting their card to and, and how it would be used and what information or privacy uh, terms would attach to it in the same way that the city is transparent about ours. So we're committed to that piece, and if we were to move forward with this, obviously we're in ongoing conversations with you all um, and would make those decisions along with you. Okay, thank you. The uh, Driver's License Access and Privacy Act, sponsored by State Senator Luis Sepulveda and Assemblymember Marcos Crespo, would expand access to driver's licenses for all state residents, regardless of their immigration status. The bill has currently passed both the Senate and the Assembly and will now head to the governor's desk for approval. Can you talk about the work the administration has done to advocate for the passage of this bill? Yeah, thank you so much. You know, this is really incredibly exciting. Um, we have um, championed the passage of this legislation for some time and we've both spoken with individual legislatures, the bill sponsors, as well as um, the mayor has released a video in support. I've, I've done op-eds and other advocacy, and so, uh, you know, we've, we are both um, uh, excited about the, the possibility here and the important win that this is, not just for immigrant communities, but for New Yorkers as a whole, um, and looking forward to being able to support uh, New Yorkers who are interested. Okay, thank you. Um, in a fiscal 2020 preliminary budget hearing, you stated that the Action New York City was looking into and potentially expanding into libraries where the city currently operates New York City citizenship and IDNYC programs. Does the administration expect to provide these services in fiscal 2020? We do not. This is a part of the ongoing, um, uh, or sorry, the, the soon to be released RFP process. Our anticipation, and this is being responsive to what we've heard from community organizations and also just wanting to be uh, conscientious um, about 
sort of what it means to be able to roll out new services or transition them, we are giving ourselves the full fiscal year of 2020 to make sure we have time to run the RFP, make selections, and for people to plan accordingly with the anticipation of 2021 being the year that the contracts would begin. Okay, thank you. Um, special immigrant juvenile status. Recently, a New York federal judge ruled that the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, an agency of the Department of Homeland Security, unlawfully denied and delayed petitions for special immigrant juvenile status after imposing new policy requirements that challenge the jurisdiction of state courts. It is said that approximately 3,000 migrant youth were affected by the arbitrary policy change imposed by U.S. Uh, CIS. Can you discuss how this, this decision will impact legal services provide, being provided to migrant youth in the city? Yeah, we were so thrilled about this decision. It's incredible testament to the work of legal service providers in fighting and winning effectively on behalf of immigrant youth. Um, we are been, we've stayed in close contact with legal aid and others to understand what's happening in terms of the decision itself and um, implementation for impacted individuals. As I noted in the testimony, um, in the fall, we allocated $4.1 million for uh, uh, providers to be able to take these very kinds of cases um, in, in representing unaccompanied children. And so we will remain in contact with providers to make sure that they have what they need to be able to address um, this important victory. Okay, thank you also. Uh, now for Census 2020. The mayor's executive budget allocated $26.4 million in fiscal 2020 to support the upcoming 2020 United States Census. Of this funding, $22 million is for contracts, $3.8 million is for 55 field organizer positions, and $490,000 is for an additional five positions. All told, there's a grand total of $29 million for the Census 2020 work spread across two agencies into the out years. Uh, can you discuss Moya's role in the 2020 census, and what role will Moya have in the um, in this partnership among the agencies that are involved? Yeah, thank you. So. Um to date and continuing, Moya serves as one of the central agencies that's working with the Census Office and Debbie Mayor Thompson's team to inform how best to um, uh, really ensure that all immigrant New Yorkers are counted and accounted for in the way that we are doing our work to engage communities. Um, we look forward to continuing to play that role I have been um, already quite active in the community talking about the importance of census. We I'm, are just coming off of a, um, a day-long retreat with cities across the country um, through our Cities for Action Coalition with one of our central focuses being census to learn from other cities. We heard from Rhode Island, um, uh, Providence specifically, as they were the city who uh, that had the practice test run to inform and understand what their experiences and learnings were. Um, we heard from Atlanta and understanding how they're building out their complete count commission. So we will continue to do our work in uh, both sharing what New York City is doing, but also bringing back learnings and expertise from other cities who are uh, focused on how to best reach and engage immigrant communities. Additionally, I was appointed to the uh, New York State's Complete Count Commission um, and have served as a commissioner on um, that commission and will help inform what the city, what the state does rather with its allocation of funds and additional resources and will be taking uh, the importance of how we best serve immigrant communities to that role as well. And which city agencies are working with you with you with the with Moya? Um, there are a number of agencies that are already all super engaged on the census. We're sort of one of the central agencies, but I've been in meetings where it's many agencies, everything from DSS to NYCHA to HPD to um, uh, the MWBE folks to PEU and others. So it was really a cross-agency collaboration and we look forward to continuing to be a part of that. DYCD also? Yes. Uh -huh. That's where the money is going to go through? Yes, that's where the um, CBO money will go through. Okay. That's correct. Uh, at the OMB hearing on May 6, Budget Director Melanie Hartzog testified uh, that of the funding in the budget for the 2020 census it would be allocated to CBOs, uh, grants, and for staffing and a media campaign. 
Is this how uh, Moya understands the parceling of work? That is how we understand it, yes. How is Moya working to ensure um, niche populations are included in the census count, uh, specifically um, newer immigrants, LGBTQ uh, communities, et cetera? Yeah, so one of the goals certainly around the funding has been to ensure that when we think about money that we're putting into communities, we're really looking at and targeting communities that have historically been undercounted. Um, and that, of course, includes the communities that you mentioned. So we are um, in, eager to ensure that that is a part of the selection of the organizations that um, receive funding and certainly the intention and the thinking. So um, with, with the RFP process, how, is those, uh, there's always I always have a concern about the um, the ability of smaller, newer immigrant groups to be able to do RFPs competitively speaking, so yes. so to speak. Um, is there going to be any type of provision for the, uh, those newer immigrant groups like Nepali, uh, Tibetan communities to be able to do the outreach? I'm particularly concerned about that because, as you probably know, yeah. Jackson Heights was is one of the areas where we had the lowest uh, turnout and, and, and the highest undercount, I think. And those are the newest communities there. That's going to be taken into consideration? So I can't speak um, specifically yet to the exact mechanism that's going to be used. Of course, this is newly allocated, though I know the conversations have already begun, of which I've been a part. So this is certainly the concern that I bring to the table and will continue to bring, um, and a shared one. We have a lot of learnings on our side on what works and in making sure that you can um, bring in and invite in smaller community-based organizations to do this work. Um, I'd also note that um, you know our hope is, and we're engaged with philanthropy um, in this space, so that they see the historic investment that the city has put forward, and that they step in to further that effort. Um, and so, obviously, want to be thoughtful about things that they could potentially more easily do that might be more challenging to us. But I think, as I understand it, the intention is to. Um, ensure that we're staying engaged with you all so you understand how we're going to move forward quickly and make sure we're, we're engaging the right folks in the best way. So I think it's good that you're working with the, um, the, the groups, with the community-based yeah. organizations. It's my understanding that in order to be a census taker, though, you have to be a citizen. Am I correct on that? That is currently the requirement. That's right. So like in those communities where we see um, high numbers of uh, non-citizens, um, would, would you just be working with the CBOs, or how do you imagine that? You know, I would, I would say, and of course I don't mean to speak for Director Menon, who I know is happy to sit with, with you all herself. Um, the experience that I've had, and I know that the Census Office has had with the Regional Census Office has been an extremely positive one. Um, these folks, as I think we all know, are not they're not uh, political appointees. These are lifelong civil and public servants who have a shared goal with us of seeing a complete count. Um, and so we've engaged with them on the hiring. Um, my office actually specifically for Nepali and other languages, they were looking for folks for their um, uh, partner uh, reps to that speak those languages. So we helped in the recruitment process um, for that, um, and also, of course, have been sharing out the job opportunities that are available for enumerators and others. Um, we've also heard from the Census Office that there is a common practice of requesting for uh, hires to be able to be non-citizens, um, simply those eligible to work. Um, and that they have undertaken in making a request to the Commerce Department to be able to expand their hiring. Um, we've been in conversations on ways that we can support that effort. Okay, interesting. Um, how many contracts are anticipated to be awarded in the RFP? I don't have that information yet. Okay. Uh, and who in Moya would be the point person for the census? Um, we've had a couple folks uh, playing point, um, but really the primary person from our office um, who has on outreach is Nick Gulota, who's our organizing director, and on other um, elements has been Ann Montesano, who, as some of you may recall, was actually the deputy director of census in 2010 um, for the administration, so has brought with her a tremendous amount of knowledge and understanding of this work. 
Okay, thank you very much. I'm gonna turn it over to Chairman Chaka. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Drum, and welcome, Commissioner. Thank you. To, to this hearing, and, and, uh, and I wanna say it's, it's, it's always great to see you, and the work that we do that happens in between these hearings is tremendous, and uh, I wanna thank you and your staff thank for, you. for your Likewise. commitment. And I know it's not easy, uh, and not only is it not easy, but it's, it sometimes gets complicated. And as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, it's concerning that while the council, many advocates, and the, many of the state legislators have come out against this cooperation with ICE and expansion of the, uh, what will circumvent the council legally, it's okay for him to do this, but uh, to expand the list of crimes. And we really want to get a, get a sense from you from uh, the kind of perspective of the mayor's office on, on how, how we got here and really what was the motivation behind the change and can you walk us through the involvement of Moya through these conversations? Um, sure, so I, um, some of this predates me in this role, so I will do my best to capture um, as best as I can. So um, as the council is aware in the passage of the legislation in, at the end of 2014, um, really the goal, the shared goal of the council and the administration has been to ensure that we're limiting cooperation um, with immigration enforcement only for folks who have been convicted in the last five years of a serious or violent uh, crime. Um, and a framework was established at that time between the administration and the council on what offenses um, were categorized as appropriate for cooperation um, and then implemented by the Department of Corrections and NYPD. Um, and a part of that has been also a recognition, as is in the legislation, that offenses are not a stagnant thing, that the state can often uh, apply or create new offenses that may otherwise fall within the framework that was established in 2014 uh, by the city. Um, and uh, as a result of that, there is a provision in there that the Department of Corrections and PD may undertake the process of reviewing, right? Are there new offenses that in, if they existed in 2014 would have been on our list? Um, and if so, staying consistent with our policy in cooperating with those offenses and those offenses exclusively. Um, but providing, of course, notice to the public through a rulemaking process that that would be what would be uh, undertaken. And that's the process that is engaged in now. So um, I think I very much appreciate the challenge presented by the communication. Um, and for me, the most important thing here is that communities know that actually the city's policy, in fact, has not shifted that the city only cooperates with folks who've been convicted in the last five years of a violent or serious offense. It's important to me to know that the offenses, that the seven new offenses that were promulgated in the last few years are actually aggravated or more serious versions of ones that are already on our list for cooperation. Um, we also anticipate that this could equate to either zero or very nominal increase of cooperation because again, these are aggravated versions of conduct and public records actually indicate that nobody has been convicted of any one of them. So um, I think the undertaking is in part a bureaucratic procedural one um, and one in which uh, uh, the mayor has wanted to remain consistent with the city's position around who we will and we won't cooperate with as uh, foreseen by the legislation. Thank you for walking us through. And I think this is really important that we have and engage conversations, not just as the council and the mayor, but really the entire community. And I think it really begs us to sit down with communities who are constantly fighting a sense of fear yep. from the federal administration. And so when effectively we are expanding our cooperation and insert these, I think, really strong points. I think you make strong points, but we can't take this without context mm -hmm. of the fear that we are experiencing. And so it just begs the question about timing. Why, why now, why now? And so if you can answer that, that'd be great. But not only that, I'm now uh, 
less confident about what else is coming. And so maybe I'm asking you, what else are you working on that's going to change the game and kind of really cause a, a, a confidence shift on the ground with us who are trying to do what we can as we talked about census and the incredible work we have to do to get people to, to, to trust us, uh, to work with us as government. And I know this isn't easy, and this is, like I said, I appreciate your, your, your support, but you, you work for a person that is, is really moving us in a different direction. Are there any other things that are on, in the works that can really shift this? It, great opportunity to tell us now. So I will say that what you know um, in terms of the proposed seven is what is been, has been presented. And again, this is through the um, bureaucratic sort of rulemaking CAPA process um, that DOC must undertake in order to be able to do this. Um, you know, I'd say a few things. I wholeheartedly agree with the challenge presented at this time um, with the fear and concern that communities have. That's why while um, it's always been in some ways a challenge to communicate the detainer policy itself, right, in telling, in being transparent and honest with communities about sort of the line that the city has struck in making these determinations, in many ways uh, the challenge is at this moment ensuring that that what we've communicated is not misunderstood with this addition. And that is a challenge. And that is something that certainly my team and office are committed to ensuring as a part of the work that we're doing. Um, and you know, recognizing that the role that we play is to ensure that any decision that's made is understood within the context um, for which we are the experts and understand uh, the impact in the communities. And so the context I provided for you were ver was very important for me personally. Again, thank you. And this is not the end of this conversation, clearly, but I do want to say that the work that we have to do is, is not just beyond this. Um, uh, this impacts carve out. You know, this is like a list of things that the mayor has done to be confusing to people, to us. And, and so we're gonna have to figure out how we can move forward with a sense of protection for the communities that we represent on, on the ground. Um, and, and really, maybe the last question, and I wanna hand it over, uh, I have a lot more questions, but I want council members to be able to ask some questions in the budget hearing before I finish it off. And there, there must be assessment that you've done at this point on how, the, how this is gonna impact your work your communications, uh, how, how, what is there any assessment to the impact of this rule change that sounds bureaucratic, but will be felt not just here, but national. Uh, media is reporting uh, right now, and, and so we are, we are in a tough spot right now. So what's the assessment, what's your plan to address this, to reconcile the fact that he's uh, wanting to abolish ICE and yet says this is the right thing to do, not just to go beyond the criminal justice system and the convictions that go through our kind of local courts, but now, now we're going into immigration court and ICE enforcement. And so now, now we have to explain all that. How, how are you gonna handle that specifically in the impact to the immigrant community. Sure. I mean, I so again, I would reiterate that I've. I think this has always been a challenge. Um, explaining the the fact that the city will cooperate in certain in, uh, instances and articulating that in a way that is digestible. My experience, by and large, is that communities do immediately understand and digest that differentiation. Of course, and it's a reminder, I think, for most of us that immigrants are not. Uh, committing crimes um, at in tremendous rates, um, that we aren't seeing uh, an exorbitant amount of cooperation with immigration enforcement right now because of that, right? They're not committing, <laughs> immigrants are not uh, committing serious crimes. In fact, we've seen a tremendous decrease in the amount of cooperation despite the increase in requests that we've seen from ICE. That level of cooperation will remain consistent even with the decision uh, to add or promulgate these new added offenses. Um, and that is because, as I noted, again, the context is important. It, we have not, as I said, publicly seen any convictions of these offenses in the last several years. 
We know that these are aggravated or worse versions of conduct that already exist on our list. Um, and so I think that's really important in any communication that we do with communities. I think assessing impact of a, a lot of policy changes is challenging. Um, and a big part of our work is to ensure that we're being open and transparent with communities so that we can uh, inform our work, right? Um, this goes through a rulemaking process, so it's not, uh, it's not in effect right now. It will go through a public hearing. There will be a full process that is undertaken that will also help inform how we need to be responsive. Well, we're going to push the mayor to rescind his request, and we'll be working on that um, here on out. Uh, Council member, or actually, uh, Trump, uh, Chair Trump. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by council members Chin, Moya, Cumbo, Cohen, Van Bremer, Eugene, and Jonai. And just also before I turn it over to um, council member Moya for questions, at what point with this new proposed rule would somebody be turned over to the custody of ICE? Sure, so um, it's not an effect. It goes through the CAPA process, as I said, meaning after a public hearing, which has not yet been scheduled, there would be, a, I believe it's a six month period before it takes effect. Um, and as a reminder, the way that the detainer policy works is that ICE itself must determine that it wants um, to know about an, a per, an infirm, uh, sorry, to know about a person in our custody. Um, and so it might be that we never cooperate with somebody who's been convicted of one of these offenses. It's really ultimately a determination on around who ICE is seeking uh, to request cooperation for. Um, I think that speaks to, as I said, the, sh the on unprecedentedly low number of times um, that the city has actually cooperated despite the fact that we've seen an increased request from them. So it's a, a, a virtually impossible answer uh, question to answer for me because um, I don't know that ICE will, would ever request cooperation for somebody who might be convicted of one of these offenses in the future. There's a lot of speculation one, that somebody is convicted of one of these, that they are an immigrant for whom ICE is looking for, and that ICE has actually requested a cooperation for that individual. One of the concerns that I have also is that um, somebody could be turned over to ICE effectively before they've had a chance to have an appeal, and in fact may be actually innocent of the charge, um, or um, it would only be uh, poor people who have to return to Rikers Island um, who then get turned over because others are, um, even when oftentimes convicted, released until um, you know a sentence can be imposed. And since uh, ICE is not allowed in New York State courthouses at this point, um, they would have you know less of a chance for ICE to take them exactly at the courthouse. So it's only really going to be those who are then put back on Rikers Island. And the only reason they go back to Rikers is because they can't p pay for oftentimes what is a low bail. So I'm not sure if I'm fully understanding the question. Um, I would note that a lot of times what actually has, happens vis-a-vis -vis the cooperation is not from us, it is from the state. Um, and that is because once a person is convicted, to your point, if they might be able to seek an appeal, it's likely that they're serving a longer term sentence. Um, and that they will not actually remain in our custody but be transferred to a state prison for a longer term sentence and it's in that period of time which they might be seeking their appeal. Um, I, I don't know if that fully answers your question. Well, no, but there, are many, there are many occasions when people um, are convicted but are uh, let out of the court on the day of the conviction uh, until or pending an appeal um, and so it would be good to know at what point would the city then cooperate with an ICE request? Um, would it be before an appeal, or, um, or when would that actually occur? Or would it just be those who then go back to Rikers because you have them in your possession? So I think those are questions that we need to look at, which is why I think it's also concerning, because it seems to me that the policy, if it were imposed the way I am hearing it, uh, would basically affect poor um, people more than it would those who are released to their own recognizance pending a, a, a future court date to come in for sentencing. 
So I, I just want to make sure what's clear is that the policy and how or when cooperation is happening kind of operationally isn't changing. That's what exists in the 2014 uh, legislation um, and nothing will change or is anticipated to change from what uh, was created and marketed in terms of when, how that cooperation is operationalized. So I think the issues that you're raising are separate from the kind of question around the addition of um, the offenses, but are ha I'm, we're happy to circle with you and make sure we fully understand and can have that conversation with you. Yeah, all right, let's, um, I want because I need to move on, but let's have that discussion, sure. okay? Yeah. Uh, Councilmember Moya, follow by Chin. Thank, thank you so much uh, to uh, Chair uh, Drummond Menchaka, Commissioner, uh, thank you. Uh, just quickly to stay on this, but isn't the reason why the judicial, you need a judicial warrant, isn't that what it's for? Um, when it comes to dealing with cooperation uh, with ICE, because my understanding is if ICE wants to go and uh, arrest someone, they would need a judicial warrant, mm -hmm. right? Why expand cooperation now with an agency uh, that has completely gone rogue under this administration um, and has not lived up to uh, what they are supposed to do in terms of their authority going into our courts uh, to expand this, basically they just need to get that judicial warrant and then that would be the end of, of that. I'm not sure why we need to expand our cooperation now uh, with this agency if they should just go through the proper procedure of any law enforcement agency that does the same thing to go get a judicial warrant to go after an individual uh, that has committed uh, any type of, of crime or felony um, that, that they go after. So I'm not, I find it very ironic that it's an administration who is saying, let's get ICE out of the courts, yet we're now expanding our cooperation uh, with this agency when we know full well uh, that all they need to do is go get a judicial warrant without us having to step in uh, to be sort of the uh, person that cooperates with them going further. That's just how I see it. Uh, my 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 uh, next qu my question. Okay. Is just, <laughs> Commissioner, I'm sorry, I, I I got a limited amount of time here. So, uh, is there a plan to include undocumented immigrants in uh, fair fares programs this coming fiscal year? Um, so, as I understand, there are ongoing conversations about the full expansion of fair fares. I don't have a, a new update um, on this, but I'm happy to circle back your way. So that's critical for us uh, who fought really hard uh, to ensure that fair fares was reaching the most vulnerable in our population. Uh, as the agency that uh, really has been in charge of rolling out some really uh, good programs, I feel that it is important and it should be critical uh, that this administration uh, do its job in ensuring that this population is included. Uh, we had had ample time uh, and the administration had ample time to look at what was going to be uh, the rollout and who was going to be impacted by that. Uh, we never got anything until uh, like four days after the deadline happened. Uh, and I just think that we're now in May and we still don't have an answer to that. And I think that's critical for a lot of our, our, our members who are here, but especially in my community, which is a high immigrant community in the areas of Corona, uh, Jackson Heights, in East Elmhurst, where uh, this is the one uh, mode of transportation that they use uh, to get to and from work. So it's really critical that we get a, a, an answer back uh, on that. Uh, and uh, also, can you explain uh, what the NYC care card will cover? Uh, and will it be able to be used for uh, mental health or addictive services um, where we're sort of seeing a spike uh, in our immigrant uh, communities? Yeah, so um, I can certainly uh, circle back with more information. We've been focused with h, &H around um, obviously, they're, they're right now expanding the primary care access as well as certain specialty cares, and that includes mental health. Um, and so this has been one of the um, 
one of the areas that we've discussed um, is mental health and addictive programs as well. Um, and so this is on the list of things that we've talked about as a part of the program, but can circle back with you with spe for specifics of, around that as well. Great. Chair, if you can, I'm just one, one quick question. So can you just tell me, is, uh, I know you had mentioned DREAM Act, and you know, as, as the lead sponsor of the New York yes. State DREAM Act for um, a number of years uh, in, in Albany, um, is there a plan to implement the DREAM Act? I know you mentioned it in your testimony. Uh, and is, uh, have you prepared to execute that plan uh, as soon as HESC uh, creates uh, the application process? Yeah, so we've been in conversations with community-based providers already um, and thinking through both understanding what they're doing and what feels most um, useful in ways that we can support as the city. Um, we are in those conversations still um, and definitely are interested in making sure that we're working together with your offices on that engagement and making sure that folks know what's available and how they can enroll. So we can, um, ha we're happy to both partner and talk more about what we're thinking. Right, it, it's just, because uh, it's also about educating kind of the frontline staff. Exactly. That will be there, the guidance counselors, uh, you know, yep. teachers in the schools that are critical to making this a success and, and sort of uh, uh, making sure that these kids know exactly uh, what they need to be doing to follow up. That's exactly so I'd love right. to continue to work with yeah. you on that, Great. Uh, Commissioner. Thank you, and thank you to uh, Chair Drummond Menchaca um, for allowing me to, to ask some questions. Thank you. Of course. Uh, thank you, uh, Councilmember Chin. Thank you, Chairs. Um, the first question I have is about the, the New York City CARE. Um, the administration is gonna be putting, they're investing $100 million annually mm -hmm. um, to help you know, New Yorkers with primary cares and, and specialty care, the one that don't have mm -hmm. access um, to health care. Now, did, uh, and then you're also going to be putting out RP for outreach to, um, which is like $450,000. Was there any coordination, like with the council, uh, to look at the initiative that we have been supporting, like access to help uh, and also uh, immigrant uh, health care, uh, to really kind of put together a more comprehensive view of health, getting people um, to be able to access healthcare services. I mean, like the council's been doing this initiative uh, and now the administration is picking it up. So I think there, hopefully that there'll be some coordination so that it could be a comprehensive program. And then we, the council can move on and do other new ideas and uh, you know, services that might be needed that we can start to work on? Sure, so thank you for the question. I think, uh, I certainly can't speak for exhaustively uh, as to the conversations the administration has had with the council on uh, NYC CARE. H&H, &H, as you know, is largely leading the initiative. We are serving as uh, support and advisor in um, the program development, also stemming from our the learnings of the work that we have already done in this space um, as uh, an office, um, and we're helping to lead on the outreach engagement piece of it. One of the things that we've heard, not just from uh, community-based providers or from the learnings that we've had, but from council on the outreach engagement side is the importance of ensuring that uh, the awareness building and the enrollment opportunities is not just happening at h, &H but it's something that community providers can support. Um, that's some, that some of that thinking is what we've helped um, bring to in shaping the RFP itself. Um, and as noted, it's going to begin in the Bronx, so we will uh, use the learnings that we have um, in the implementation in the Bronx as well, have further conversations with you all and making sure that as we continue to advance the rollout of the program as a whole, uh, we're being responsive to what's working and what isn't. Yeah, and I just hope that there will be a more collaborative you know, effort because otherwise it's like we're doing our own initiative and the administration is doing something much broader that, broader that could have just included everything. Um, the, the other question I have is on the census. Um, the council asked for 40 million and the administration only you know, put in an additional um, 
22 million and with the 4 million before. Um, so my question is, do you think that is sufficient? Uh, and also, the other thing is that you're gonna be spending um, 10 million on doing outreach. And I just wanted to see if there was any, um, especially with your, your agencies, any uh, coordinations with the ethnic media mm -hmm. and how they will be involved in this process. I'm talking about really engaging them and you know sitting down with them and getting their uh, ideas and suggestions how to do the broader outreach to the immigrant community uh, because of such diversity, and also you know having the resources to support that. And I'm not talking about just you know buying ads, you know like in the past or whatever, but really a uh, a comprehensive plan of outreach that will you know, involve the local and the ethnic media yeah. to really target uh, the immigrant community so that we can all be counted. Yeah, so thank you. So I, um, I can say that again, the focus of the allocation and the calculation that went into it was uh, looking specifically at um, communities or populations that have been historically undercounted and ensuring that that is our focus in terms of where city dollars are going to go and ensuring uh, that we're being responsive to the concerns that we have in reaching these populations and, and frankly um, uh, combating some of the challenges that we have in their participation. This is of course uh, in addition to the state's allocated $20 million and the administration continues on, uh, ongoing conversations with philanthropy. Um, we have made a historic investment. We know that philanthropy across this country have stepped up uh, to support uh, complete count commissions, cities, other locations in this work, and we hope that we see that realized here in New York City as well. Um, as the budget director testified to uh, earlier, um, uh, I believe last week, um, we, this is our initial investment um, and it is based on sort of looking at all of these um, pieces and um, in ensuring that we get a high self-response from those harder to reach communities. And uh, if we evaluate with, with uh, um, our team, with you all, with community partners, that, that more is needed, then that conversation, that door is open for that conversation to continue. Um, I think that your point on community and ethnic media is hugely critical and important. Um, I myself already uh, with Deputy Mayor Thompson and others have had community and ethnic media roundtables about the census. Um, we know how critical uh, the um, uh, outlets that serve immigrant communities and in sharing information to, uh, with them are in getting good information in their hands. That's been a part of the thinking in terms of the resources that have been allocated, as you uh, noted, but also that that active engagement um, with those outlets has to happen to make sure that we're all effectively communicating good information to folks uh, in a wide, diverse array of medians. Yeah, because like, you know, there's, all these changes since last time. Yeah. I mean, there might be a citizenship question on there and that's gonna yeah. have a great impact. And the other thing is that they're not gonna have the paper ballot, um, I mean, paper questionnaire like they did in the past where you could actually pick one up in the library and fill it out. Now you have to go online or you have to call. And then especially in immigrant community, you have overcrowded household. How do you make sure everyone in that household is counted? So we gotta start early. We can't, you know, sure. this is already uh, May. Uh, we can't like, uh, we have less than a year. I mean, so that's why like the, the ethnic media is critical, community-based organization. Uh, we gotta really gear that up. And the council, we have a task force, so we wanna really work with the administration to make sure that we get everyone counted. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chairman Chaka, and I apologize, I have to leave, I have a, LGBT Pride celebration in Queens, and I need to go. So it's important to celebrate. Thank you. Yes, Thank it's you. Uh, the first I think of um, many for the Stonewall 50 celebration. Yes. Wonderful. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. A, a good Chaka celebration. Over. Yes. No, absolutely. Thank you, Chair. Uh, and I will continue with my with my questions and and thank the the members of the council who are here, uh, including Councilmember Jonai from the Immigration Committee. I 
Uh, I, I guess the, where I want to start is really with adult literacy. I just came from the Brooklyn, uh, kind of the Brooklyn rally, and we've been doing rallies like this in every borough uh, with the advocates, really kind of sending the message. This year is is very different, and we want to say thank you to you and the advocacy you're doing internally, Office of Management and Budget. They're holding a lot of the power in this negotiation, but we now have seen the earliest ever the $8 million. Mm -hmm. Super happy about it. A few questions about that. Great. One is, uh, do you see an RFP op opportunity for really rethinking how we have for a long time seen the necessity to change the way that we are paying our teachers to move into a multi-year contract, uh, to really think about multi-wraparound multi, uh, services for these classrooms uh, that are not just going to immigrant communities, but really all, a, a whole host of, of New Yorkers with needs. Uh, Childcare is one of the things that taught. So tell us a little bit about where where you are on that, sure. and and really kind of specifically pushing for the eight million that are on the city side. Um, so I'd say a few things. We've been working very closely with the Office for Workforce Development um, to ensure that sort of as a city, our intentions on adult literacy are holistic and thoughtful. Um, and they have tremendous expertise on the adult literacy side um, with veterans in the space um, in that office. And so they've been a huge uh, critical resource and um, addition to the internal conversations that we've been undertaking. Um, the, uh, a part of which is that we have together been working with CUNY to undertake a larger uh, look at uh, the sort of world of adult literacy spending and understand. Um, we've heard obviously from the providers. Um, we have a sense of how what's been working and hasn't been working, but we also wanted a kind of independent evaluation to also help inform what an RFP should look like. Um, and so we're hoping to get that uh, soon. Um, and um, obviously would be happy to share some kind of initial thinking around it. Thank you for that, and I, th I'm, I'm, I think we're all talking to the same people in some ways, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and really what, what's important here is the push for baseline, and it sounds like you're open to baseline and pushing that within the administration, so I want to kind of hear whether you're, you're, you're thinking baseline makes sense for us in discussion. Um, we absolutely, Moya believes and thinks it makes sense to ensure that we are being as thoughtful and, uh, as we can be and as smart as we can be with an RFP process. Um, and um, so baseline would be required to do an RFP process. It would be very process. helpful, yes. <laughs> it would be impossible not to do that. Uh, okay, thank you for saying that. Thank you. Okay, so let's just move right next to it, next to the next piece, which is that doesn't mean that we get baseline today for this. You know, fiscal year, and your 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 kind of testimony sh shares that you're you're engaging with with outside kind of thinkers about how to how to do this thoughtfully. Would you be open to creating a task force that allows us to kind of back into this with a years long work of task force related work and really build a task force for both the city council and the mayor's side can really build that ultimate team to get us where we need to get to. Are you open in in helping advocate for that? You know, I think we've had these conversations before. What was important to us, um, certainly to me, and um, what has been to ensure that there is centralized thinking in the administration that is working for and championing this work in the right way. And um, we've had tremendous support from Deputy Mayor Thompson and his team in seeing that realized. Um, and, uh, you know, our, our happy to consistently uh, be a part of the thought leadership on this. None of that thought leadership has happened in isolation of us, of course. It's happened with the coalition, with providers, with others. And so I think as they are sort of newly taking on the leadership role of this work broadly and its connection um, to a landscape of services for individuals who kind of find themselves at one stage of literacy and then might end up at another in terms of actual workforce. Um, I'm sure there are lots of ways to make sure that there's thoughtful thinking about how to get different voices in the mix um, and um, might leave it there. <laughs> okay. 
I think we both, we all want quality education. Yes. And we, we know that this system, and we've kind of got, come back with the same response every year, uh, is not working. We want a better and higher quality education system that's going to really impact thousands. For sure. Years. And the CUNY evaluation on our part was an attempt to help us realize some of that. I think, like you noted, that we're, we're a lot of us are talking to the same folks. And what right. we really wanted to be able to do was to pull back um, from those personal conversations and maybe have an independent kind of evaluation of um, the education and the delivery and the service. And so maybe from there we can continue conversations on what makes sense. Before I leave adult literacy, I want to yeah. ask that we have a um, kind of commitment that the $8 million that was in the budget remain 100% adult literacy. Every year uh, we negotiate... Uh, and part of that, I think last year was a million, we clocked in at about a million, didn't go to seats, didn't go to education seats, and it went to other projects, uh, including one that won the Emmy, and congratulations to the team for, for that. I think that's a really cool you. thing. We thanked you. We thanked the council. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Uh, complicated <laughs> feelings there. But congratulations all around. Um, that's for another hearing. <laughs> we'll come back to that. Uh, but... But we're really dedicated in education mm -hmm. course, stuff that's going to move people through. Um, and, and so can we get a commitment from you that you can, you can stand with us yet again? And though OMB are the final say, we want to make sure that the full $8 million go to classroom instruction. So I'd say a couple of things. that One, it's a, um, more challenging for me to be immediately responsive to that question, as I know some of the challenges have simply been around um, the ability to do that if there is uh, one-time funding. Um, and that's for obvious So that's why we reasons. need the RFP, so you guys can't take money from that. So that's one consideration okay. in terms like of what, ch what challenges might exist in being able to put money out for one, one year without the assurance that you have it going forward. Because when you increase a classroom size, obviously it's... Right, that creates a challenge if, if you don't have dedicated funding moving forward. So that's been one of the considerations. And as you've heard me say before, our goal, certainly from my, my side, is not to say, you know, Rob Peter to pay Paul, but to um, ensure that we are advocating for increased capacity to do important work, including around the literacy space. Um, and we've done that. There obviously may be difference of opinions in how best you do that or exactly where you put that money, but I think the goal of making sure what we're doing is actually increasing capacity in the field to serve limited English proficient New Yorkers has been the same. And the only thing that I want to add to that is it's not just capacity, it's quality. And so of course. I think we've been focused on capacity, and I think everyone's now ready to focus on quality. I think it's both. And, and it's both. Yes. No yes. doubt. Oh, please. Yes. I want, I want yes. both. But we can't have both because OMB continues to um, block that. And that's okay. And I get it. That's their role. But that's not our role. Our role, we can kind of hold these, these questions in front of us and, and do that together. Um, and I'm gonna hand it over for a question to Councilmember Eugene. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, Chair. I'm, very, I'm gonna be very brief and very, very, very brief. Commissioner, it's a Hi. pleasure to see you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Likewise. Uh, my question is going to be also uh, about the census. Mm -hmm. I know probably uh, many questions have been asked about that. But I got, uh, my question would be especially, because I remember during the after or during the census 2010, and the situation was uh, regular, the environment was not the environment that we are seeing today. But I think that um, based on the statistic, Brooklyn and Queens were undercounted, I believe. Mm -hmm. And when I was helping the census also, one thing that I realized is even for people who are legal in the United States, many of them, they don't want to give the information to government. You know that for many reasons. Yes. I'm talking about citizens. I'm talking about people with green card. They don't want to release the information. So that means they, they didn't participate you know, in the census. And this is very uh, negative. The, the, the impact is very negative for our city. 
because we know that uh, based on the census, we will have more resources for everything that will make a big difference in the life of everybody in New York City. And I realized that uh, most of the time, people are prone, they are more comfortable to release information to people that they respect or their trust, leaders in the community, organization in the communities where they are living. My question is, what the administration is doing in terms of collaborating with communities in the different ethnicity and also leaders in the different communities to ensure that uh, the people we are going to ask to release the information, uh, you know, uh, uh, they can have somebody they trust, somebody they know that will feel more confident to, to release those information. What is, uh, uh, what are the different steps? What is the strategy that the city is taking to ensure that we can make people more comfortable in releasing their information? Sure, so I would um, certainly uh, uh, recommend further conversation on this with the census office, um, who's beginning to really shape the broader strategy around all communities and not just, of course, immigrant populations or communities. Um, I would say a, a central goal of the funding, as I noted earlier, is to ensure that we are focused on the under traditionally or historically undercounted communities. You know, New York City actually came in at a lower um, count rate than the nationwide average. Um, our uh, you know, we and there was never in the in 2010 any actual dollar allocation towards um, the census. So of course we've already seen a huge shift um, in ensuring not only do we have a dollar allocation, we have dedicated staff that's looking at a coordinated citywide engagement and initiative in engaging communities who've been undercounted and really. Um, you, what you know on ensuring that we're working with community leaders, trusted voices already is key to um, uh, a successful uh, engagement and a part of the thinking already. Thank you. But, uh, but what I'm trying to understand is that did the city already uh, 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 reach out to people who speak the languages of the people that, of, you know, that we are going to serve in different communities. Yeah. That's something that has been done already. Sure, yes. There. In different ways, um, as I, there are a few, there are a few layers, right, a few things. We've already begun certainly engaging uh, leadership in different communities, talking um, at either community events or meetings or uh, panels. Um, that work has just begun. Um, in terms of engaging people in different languages, as I noted, part of the work that we've done, certainly out of my office as well, has been making sure that community-based organizations understand that the Census Bureau, the regional office, is hiring um, so that they can uh, ensure that the person who is um, engaging in the work either as a a partner with the community or as an enumerator um, can speak the language of the community. This is something that the census office itself is committed to doing. Um, so we've been working with them on that front. But in terms of the recent allocation of dollars, um, certainly that's something that we will be looking at in terms of the community-based organizations or community leaders uh, with whom the, uh, the city will partner and give funds to do the work. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. Thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you, Council Member. And uh, we have a few more uh, questions to go through before we end the, the hearing, and we're thankful uh, that you're here today uh, to kind of help us walk through some of these pieces. And I want to move over to NYC CARE. You, you, saw, you heard a lot of questions from the Council Members. And, and, and you know, in similar fashion, so many of these categories of, of work, adult literacy, the detainer law, they, these decisions happen without cooperation with us. Uh, 
yeah, you're increasing cooperation with ICE, but okay, <laughs> let me get, give me that for a moment. And NYC Care is one of those cards that we had no idea that this was in the works. So we, we heard about it very recently when the mayor launched his video campaign on Twitter. When did you first hear about this and how, how did you kind of think about it? And you're holding IDNYC as well. And yep. we have been talking about healthcare for a long time in our rooms. Yep. And so this felt a little bit um, concerning in this longer kind of quest to work together to think about these things holistically. And now it seems like you're moving in a whole different direction. So tell us a little bit about, about IDNYC in relationship to the NYC Care Card. And, sure. And when you first heard about this program. Um, so we have engaged in numerous conversations around um, ID or the card that people would be able to utilize for purposes of the um, for the NYC care program and uh, we have certainly some kind of understandings of the benefits of using IDNYC for two reasons. One is, of course, um, the work that we did around Action Health and utilizing it as the primary card for folks um, who did the program. But the other is that we have an integration with h, &H where any, any New Yorker currently... With IDNYC. Yes. Where any New Yorker currently can actually go and essentially streamline their membership um, using IDNYC and then from there use IDNYC as the card that they use or present when they um, engage with the hospital. Um, and there were a couple of reasons that a decision was made to sort of maintain the, real, the sort of use of IDNYC the same. Um, uh, one or two rather key or central ones um, have to do with the fact that as anybody here who has insurance knows, you can pull out your card now and it has some key information on it, right? It has your, um, uh, the phone number that you can call to get information about your care. It has um, specific information about the program or the insurance that you are a part of. Um, so we talked through with Dr. Katz and others. And you're walking team. through the NYC care card. I'm your your health insurance card. Oh, your health insurance. Right, um, and we talked through with Dr. Katz in the initial thinking and others about uh, sort of the importance of having that information um, on a card for your healthcare plan. The importance for people to be able to look at their card and. Uh, know who their doctor is or know what number to call and those are being some of the central goals around the program itself. Um, we didn't want to uh, sort of force IDNYC on top of that but rather give people the option that if you enroll for NYC care you're given this card that has this important information for you on it but if you're you personally only want to use your IDNYC as you come in and out of your service, you can do that. You can say, I just want my IDNYC to be my central card, um, but you're given initially this card with important information for you to be able to access your service. Okay, let me see if I got this correct. Okay. Essentially, <laughs> the NYC card is a more kind of addition with more information that you can have and can be your sole primary connection to this program. Or you can say, I still want to use my DNYC card for my connection, but I'll have this additional card anyway. Correct. Just in case. So I have that information just if I need it. Just have it. Yes. As, and, okay, so then IDNYC card is an NYC, or IDNYC is an NYC care card, essentially. It can be. It can, it can be. be. Any, yeah, for sure. Got it. Super helpful. Great. Thank you for, for walking us through that. More to come later, but we can't. And hopefully that struck the right balance for folks, right? We wanted people to be able to, you know, if you don't feel comfortable presenting a card that has more information on it about your health coverage for your own personal reasons, you can use your IDNYC. But we yeah. knew that to give people proper health access, they needed more information on a card, and that was that's the goal. Any community organizations that were consulted on this? We, we consulted lots of groups as we um, looked, obviously, at Action Health, um, and a lot of the considerations and concerns people had that were raised with us were around privacy, um, and that informed this thinking as well. Got it. 
more to come later on that, but not, not right now. Uh, pulse site interpreters, thank you so much for, to, for talking about it in your testimony. You mentioned a million extra dollars in, so super exciting. Yeah. I just wanted to confirm that. Uh, it's something that I think both sides have been working on with the advocates on the ground. Mm -hmm. So access to democracy is so, so critical. An additional 300K was added to the, uh, the, ni the 19 budget for the administration of the pulse site interpreter program. The FY20 executive budget restores the 640 K uh, in the 20 budget for the poll site interpreter program. So can you please explain how the total 940,000 will be divided among the election events in 2019 and 2020? No, because it's different. So <laughs> yeah, walk me through the, the yeah. different pieces and, and really as it lands in the different years. Sure. So um, 940 is correct in the fiscal year 19. This, as you noted, was 640 plus the additional allocation. Um, as folks are aware, we didn't um, account for special elections, but here we are, and so, and have been in February and tomorrow. Um, and so um, we, you know, to the best of our abilities, um, quickly assessed what we would be able to do um, with the short notice for the elections, um, consistent with what we've um, uh, uh, done in the in the November general. And so, um, with that kind of quick analysis and assessment, we got to 940. So, for uh, a total of three elections this past year, um, and. Um, uh, estimated what we would need to do the June primary and the November general. Um, and uh, obviously the June primary is included in the 940, the November general is the allocation for 2020. Um, so we're anticipating uh, the November general plus another primary that will, I believe, happen in April, if I'm correct. Um, there are three fixed elections <laughs> and s some support if we, are, if we find ourselves with another special. Thank you for kind of walking us yeah. through those pieces. And how were the election events selected for, those, for the poll site interpreter program? Um, how are the locations Yeah, selected? specifically, um, or just like the election... Well, actually, let's go to how much of the funding will cover full-time poll site interpreter staff. The vast majority of the funding does that. Vast. Is there a percentage? I mean, this is almost. Um, I would I would have to get back to you on the exact percentage. Um, almost all, nearly all, than the 640 did. Um, we. We operated before, which is not very tenable, with in-kind support from <laughs> our office and um, Office of Operations and then with some temporary staff who we were able to bring on board um, to support for the implementation of the projects. And so, this, as folks know, the CEC, or the Civic Engagement Commission, um, is now fully, uh, or will be rather fully responsible for the implementation of the uh, poll site interpretation initiative, um, thanks to the charter revision and the voters overwhelmingly passing that. So um, it's anticipated that the CEC will um, bring on staff that will help with the operations and implementation of the program. Um, but as I said, that's pretty minimal, the vast majority is actually going to both the operations and the interpreters themselves. Thank you for that. And how much of this funding will cover language interpreters for these elections and election events? Um, the inter actual interpreters. The vast majority so of that still, goes to interpreters. Okay. Yeah. So full-time, and these are language interpreters. So full-time meaning the day of the elections, right? So we work with a, um, a, a organization with whom we contract. So of course they're supporting in terms of recruitment of interpreters and screening and so forth. Um, and um, uh, in addition to them and operational needs to uh, ensure we have the right setup, et cetera, the rest of the money goes to the interpreters themselves. Got it. Which kind of begs the question about the the kind of infrastructure. Is there a director for the pole site interpreter 
team. Yeah, so it will be the chair of the commission, the newly appointed Dr. Um, Sarah Saeed, which is wonderful, and um, the team that will uh, kind of take over the full implementation of it will report into her and the CEC structure. Um, we will continue to hold a big role this year and um, uh, provide uh, for outgoing years guidance and advice on the thinking, on where we should be, the methodology, and so forth, as required by the charter revision. And how much of this funding will cover marketing, if most of this is going to staff? We did minimal marketing before, and of course a part of that is because um, we're just getting our feet wet <laughs> and making sure that we uh, fully understood the implementation of the work and what it looked like. Um, so I think that will be something that we, we begin to look at and discuss as we head into June and November. And how much of this will be for the, I mean th that you're just basically saying We'll we'll do some and, and we'll if we need. We more. did we did some marketing for recruitment of interpreters. We found that okay. necessary. We weren't getting enough um, interpreters simply by word of mouth and sharing information with our contacts. Okay. So um, we you know we did some there and um, similarly will again if we need to. Um, but this is a great pla place to plug in the language bank uh, that I know is on your desk yes. and the deputy mayor yes. is really excited about it. Yes. I think everybody that hears yeah. about it is excited about it. I don't know if the mayor is excited about it, but we are excited about it. Um, what other things will be purchased uh, beyond beyond what we've just discussed, marketing yep. and staff? So what we've um, had to do is, of course, um, the Board of Elections has not um, been our most eager partner, so we've had to set up our own tables and chairs for interpreters. So those are things that we don't purchase, but we rent. Um, and of course, um, uh, you know, um, basic sort of needs for the interpreters. Um, thank God, no longer outside. Um, but you know, before we've had to um, ensure we were accommodating for things like being outside. Um, and so, uh, it's primarily uh, the rental of things. Um, I think we've purchased tablecloths. Um, and pins for the interpreters to identify themselves and shirts, things like that, um, but not the, the big bulk of um, the cost. Great, thank you. Uh, according to Chapter 76 of the Charter, the Civic Engagement Commission will make public its proposed methodology on January 1, 2020. However, money has been allocated for poll site interpreter provision in both the 1920 budgets for 2019 election events. Will Moya or the CEC be providing poll site interpretation in 2019? Moya is working with the Office of Operations for 2019. Operations. Mm -hmm. Okay. If so, then if the Civic Engagement Commission, um, so if it's not the operations, this means that the commission will then begin administrating the program before methodology it uses it is made public and responsive to the public comment. So I guess what we're trying to figure out is is, is how how are we kind of discussing this in the public and, ha and providing oversight? Sure, so um, I think as the charter revision requires, the CEC has to take it over in 2020. And so we're working with um, the newly appointed chair and uh, obviously, as I noted, Mayor's Office of Operations to ensure that there's a seamless transition while the CEC is forming and they're staffing up. So we don't want a gap in, in the service, we wanna continue to deliver it, so we'll work together until they're able to fully take it over as required by the charter in 2020. Got it. Thank you. And, and I should note, just to, to I sure. think, more explicitly answer your question, though I think the council has directed um, their questions accordingly. We're working closely with the chief democracy officer, obviously, as well. So in terms of sort of central questions, I think still appropriate to come to Moya and the chief democracy officer until the CEC takes full control over the project. And clearly, we, we're very excited about this uh, and working in partnership yeah. with you. And this is why we're asking kind of very detailed questions and trying to figure out how we can create uh, a, a, a better sense of response to our communities. And mm -hmm. each of these communities that we represent are intimate to us, and every site is yep. 
is very specific. So in 2019, which election events will be targeted for poll site interpretation? Uh, do you have that list? Do you have a sense of that and how you're kind of building that? And will this include early voting poll sites? Good questions. So um, it will include, um, so we've done the February special. We will be, be doing tomorrow's special. Um, we will be doing the June primary and we'll be doing the November general. Um, that is what we've already accounted for in our thinking um, and in the budget request. And um, we have yet to fully decide on early voting and how we would implement that and operationalize it. That's something we welcome kind of conversation and thought around. Um, and obviously part of that has been dependent also at looking at where the BOE um, actually provides early voting opportunities. Um, as the council is aware, the BOE is, I, I believe, committed to 38 locations. The administration has said that we would support through budget allocation um, up to a, at least 100. And so um, I think are hopeful that there will be more locations, um, but sort of ultimately depending on where uh, they land, we would also look at what our methodology looks like as we overlay it over that to see what it would mean if we wanted to do early voting and how we could do that. And that's for 19 and for 20, essentially. It's the same strategy, yeah, the same for, strategy. for both. Well, I think we have some ideas, too, so we're Great. very excited to keep continue working with you. Um, I want to go back to IDNYC really quick and really think about this next phase and working with bank services and and we are we are in deep discussions and we're having I think very productive conversations. Yeah. I want to thank you and your leadership and your team of really opening those doors for that conversation. As difficult and 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 technical as they are, I think <laughs> they're very important. So yep. thank you. Of course. I also want to ask about uh, because this is a budget hearing, thinking about revenue uh, and and some of the membership concepts you talked about. Uh, the current uh, Big Apple RX and some other yeah. membership opportunities, including the museums. And it gives us opportunity to think about more membership styles, especially yeah. these buying programs. Are there any plans for revenue, creating revenue streams out of whatever comes in IDNYC 2.0? Yeah. And can you talk a little bit about that too? Because that has an impact on budget and how we, how we how we do policy on a card that now can re create revenue. Yeah, um, so thank you. I think, you know, there's a lot of creative um, sort of kinds of cards that have been uh, sort of produced nationally that look at um, the question I think that you're asking, and I think, you know, we've looked at those in our thinking around IDNYC and whether or not that's something that we would want to see realized through this program. Um, I think um, we have recognized ourselves out the gate, but certainly even more with, in conversations with you all and advocates that kind of in order to get there, we have to probably start at a different place um, and make sure that we're confident in what we're doing and that um, what we're providing is being is directly responsive to what we've heard from cardholders in terms of their interest and New Yorkers who are underbanked um, and unbanked and in, in terms of their needs. Um, so we have in this sort of preliminary stage of thinking thought more around the kind of collective bargaining question as a part of what we could do here as well as in the consumer education piece um, and thinking about ways in which that's not owned just by necessarily the city, um, and, and if there are ways to bring in um, organizations to be a part of kind of financial empowerment. So those are probably two central areas that we've focused on for sort of this initial phase of thinking. So it sounds like you're saying um, maybe, we don't know, and we need to figure out how, how it works. Is that ultimately, because I guess I'm, I'm looking for any, any specific, I, I mean, I'm asking very kind of specific questions in light of, I think, so many decisions that are kind of sometimes made um, without consultation with the council. And mm -hmm. so this is, this is, and this is a special program where really it was kind of birthed out of a, a collective conversation through legislation, um, which is where it's rooted in. This is, this program is rooted out of legislation. So I'm just looking for, um, anything specific that you're kind of looking at in terms of revenue and really uh, 
connected to the banking services. Yeah. So, I mean, as to your point, it's rooted out of uh, kind of a shared um, and collaborative process on creating the, the program, a part of which obligates us to continue looking at how we're expanding banking access for cardholders and New Yorkers. And so um, really where we've started this is um, that question as a part of it, and the second being the growth of the program, right? As we've done with integrations like H&H, um, and um, the Big Apple RX and others sort of looking at what's been working and New Yorkers have been responsive to and wh what we do to further institutionalize and see the, the full success of the program beyond all of us, right? Um, and so um, I think to your question on kind of the revenue generating uh, piece, that is something we've looked at. It's something we've talked to folks about. Um, it is not necessarily something that we, beyond the two areas that I pointed to, immediately see in these conversations. We, I think there are, are, we are a few steps away from getting to a deeper conversation about that. Got it. So I know we have to wrap up here, and I think the last question I want to ask is really about a kind of holistic approach to you're looking at the census, we're looking at public charge, we have impacts there, um, the NYC care card, and whether or not immigrants are gonna say yes to it in light of this very confusing situation that we're in right now with the detainer law. And you know, we asked Julie Menon to come in and talk a little bit about that here, and we just couldn't get it, we couldn't get it together. We, we sent a letter and uh, just, we needed a lot more lead time, so the structure didn't fit for that. So we're looking forward to working with you and really being in that room with us to, mm -hmm. to think about this together. Um, so how, how are you assessing the sense of, of connection to immigrant communities and whether that's gonna have a budget impact, whether that maybe means more funding to do more communication, to disentangle uh, your message, or at least your, your, your leader uh, message. Uh, on how how this is all still moving in a good direction, even yeah. though we're agreeing to disagree on on the actual policies. Sure. So I I'd say a couple of things. Um, I think certainly um, we are all extremely proud of so much work that the administration and the council have done and done together in to in advancing the interests of immigrant New Yorkers. I think IDNYC is a critical piece of that. Immigration legal services. You know, we're at a remarkable, I think it's $48 million in investment towards immigration legal services, and that's a, a addition this fiscal year already of $500,000 to the IOI program and 1.6 to knife up with ongoing conversations as well. So, um, you know, fighting and litigating on, on uh, our behalf to maintain our policies as they are, refusing to increase our cooperation at the behest of ICE um, where they want us to and winning in court and doing that litigation. I think so much of what we've done and, and much of it together has, I hope, sent the right message to all communities. And within that context, we also passed the detainer law legislation. And so, um, much of what we've said both throughout the last few years with two communities as well as through our litigation and so forth is that this is the balance that the city has struck. Um, and we don't listen, we won't listen to or comply with ICE's overbroad enforcement. That's not who we are. And um, I, I, while I appreciate and share some of the concerns that you've raised, um, our goal is really that that message is still consistent um, and the same. And while complicated, we will work hopefully together to try and combat concerns that communities have. Um, and we have talked to and continue to engage with agency partners on the best way to do that and understanding what they're seeing. Um, we have, uh, throughout this year, um, initiated a few uh, campaigns where we've seen targeting of populations, including around fraud and other pieces, um, and public charge, a big one, and we are continuing to look at and think about how best to be responsive to those concerns. Our hope with the thoughtfulness around NYC CARE and already 
an investment in uh, 450,000 in Bronx CBOs just for our Bronx rollout demonstrates that we know that we're not the, necessarily the right or only voice um, in talking to community partners, but that community leadership really has to be at the table and a part of the conversation. So um, we're committed to doing that work, as I said in my testimony and mean, um, to working with you all and others and making sure we are responding to concerns and doing our best to ensure communities hear our message um, and understand while some things are complicated as they always have been, as I noted, um, we are, you know, our commitment to our communities is the same. And so um, I look forward to continuing those conversations. We've had them not just with you all, um, but also internally with OMB and we'll continue to have those conversations. Well, thank you, uh, Commissioner thank you. and your staff and your team for your hard work and all the staff and team that brought us here. I'm going to let you have the last word on this, on, at this budget hearing, um, which, but it won't be the final word on this okay. uh, as we move <laughs> forward. But I'll let you have uh, the last word as we, as we move forward and struggle towards social justice for our immigrant community. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to close this executive budget hearing. Thank you all for being here today.